Maximus Primus. Revenge, an epic tale of vengeance and triumph. How did all this started? Maximus Primus, a former special ops officer and colonel in the Earth Federation of World, made a life-altering decision. He left the military, a world he was deeply ingrained in, to devote more time to his son. Maximus's wife, the love of his life, had passed away, leaving behind their son, Patrick. Patrick was not just a part of Maximus's life, he was his life. Every day, as Maximus looked into Patrick's eyes, he saw a reflection of his beloved wife, a constant reminder of the love they shared. Maximus, with his young five-year-old son, Patrick Osiris Primus in tow, embarked on a vacation to the quad regions of a neutral planet in the Putanese sector. Patrick, a bright and precocious child, idolized his father. He was a quick learner, always eager to absorb the wisdom and skills his father possessed. Maximus, a man of honor and respect, was the epitome of a role model in Patrick's eyes. The Earth's Federation and the military love him highly. They also love Patrick because of the humorous ways he shows across the galaxy and on social media with his dad. Yes, everyone loves little Patrick. Yes, everyone admired Patrick just as much as his dad. Maximus and Patrick arrived in the bustling capital city of Creeks, a metropolis teeming with life and diversity, to meet with the humans and Putinese delegation about education and young military exchange between the two worlds. The Putinese, a mixed species of humanoid and insectoids, were a highly advanced civilization with an elite military. The Putinese, a highly advanced civilization with an elite military, were ruled by an emperor who was the embodiment of arrogance. He governed with an iron fist, showing little mercy and exercising pure dictatorial power. The state he presided over was marred by slavery and other civil rights violations, a stark contrast that Maximus hated dearly. While Maximus was attending meetings, Patrick was left under the care of nannies at the facility, unaware of the danger that lurked. Maximus attended the meetings all day. During this time, Patrick and a group of other kids were visiting a historical site. Patrick became lost and couldn't find his nanny or group. He found his way to the top of a marble wall to find his nanny. He still couldn't see her in the crowd. Patrick was captured by two guards. Thinking he was being helped, he was arrested and taken before the emperor. The emperor sat high upon his throne, looking down as little Patrick. The emperor asked who this creature was and what his crime was. The guard said the human was on the wall of Sept. The Sept wall was built for the emperor's family and has ruled for over five million years. Little Patrick was crying and scared, asking for his father and saying he was sorry. He never knew what he was sorry for. He never was given a hearing or trial, sitting high on his throne. The emperor laughed angrily and walked down to Little Patrick. The emperor started walking in circles around Patrick. At this time, the nannies raced back to the facility. She burst into the meeting, telling Maximus that the guard had taken his son to the emperor. Everyone in the room was horrified, knowing the emperor was an evil ruler. Maximus ran as fast as he could to get to his son. Once Maximus reached the palace, he broke past the guard, knocking the big golden doors open and forced his way through the crowd. There, he saw his little Patrick's lifeless body lying on the floor. Maximus looked up toward the throne, and Emperor Tabone started laughing with his audience. Little Patrick had been beheaded and disemboweled. Maximus screamed, Who murdered his son? He saw the Emperor's sharp claws dripping with fresh red blood. Maximus rushed to the throne. It took fifty guards to hold Maximus. Maximus yelled, Why, he was only five years old, child! What type of monster could kill a five-year-old child? The Emperor laughed even louder. You stupid ape humans need to learn the emperor ways. The emperor laughed even more. The emperor said, take your ape son and leave my empire as he walked back up to his throne. Maximus said to the emperor, you might as well leave that throne and run. Run as fast and far as you can. The emperor turned around and sat back on his throne laughing yet again. Emperor Tabone said, you may go. Maximus went to pick his son body up. The emperor said, now you can go, but the body will stay. The guards grabbed Maximus, dragging him from the court. The emperor said, I will burn your son's body on the temple tower's wall, where your worthless son stood for emperors only. He will burn it as if it were trash. Maximus's eyes were filled with pure hate as he yelled back at the emperor, 
There are no walls, tomb, temple, nor a throne that will save you. I want you to remember my son's name, Patrick Osiris Primus, and you will ask the gods to save you, and I am Maximus Primus, the man that will kill you. Chapter 1. The Spark of Rebellion The deep void of space was a sea of stars, each one a silent witness to the unfolding drama. In the darkness, a convoy of Putoni's ships glided through the void, their sleek forms illuminated by the dim glow of distant suns. Unbeknownst to them, death was lurking in the shadows. Maximus Primus stood on the bridge of his flagship, the Sentinel, which he renamed in honor of his son. Osiris was a sleek red and gold vessel that was both a symbol of his undying resolve and a testament to human engineering. His eyes, cold and focused, scanned the holographic display before him. His fleet, composed of seasoned veterans and battle-hardened ships, lay in wait, cloaked in the inky blackness of space. Prepare for battle, Maximus commanded his voice, a calm but powerful beacon amidst the tension. His second-in-command, Lieutenant Commander Sarah Kale, acknowledged the order with a sharp nod. She was a formidable presence, with piercing green eyes and auburn hair pulled back in a tight bun. Her uniform, crisp and immaculate, reflected her meticulous nature and unwavering loyalty to Maximus. All units, initiate phase one, she relayed into her communicator, her voice steady and authoritative. The fleet moved with silent precision, like predators closing in on unsuspecting prey. The Osiris's engines hummed softly as it glided forward, leading the charge. Maximus watched the enemy convoy grow larger on the display, his mind already mapping out the battle to come. Enemy vessels in range, reported Ensign Victor Dre, a young but capable officer with an analytical mind and a knack for tactical maneuvers. Maximus's eyes narrowed. Fire at will. The silence of space was shattered by the roar of weapons fire. The Osiris's cannons erupted in a blaze of light, unleashing a torrent of energy bolts that streaked toward the Putinese ships. Explosions blossomed across the enemy hulls, sending debris and bodies spiraling into the void. The Putinese, caught off guard, scrambled to return fire. Their ships, insectoid in design, were formidable in their own right, bristling with weaponry and reinforced with advanced shielding. But the element of surprise was on Maximus's side. As the battle raged, Maximus directed his fleet with surgical precision. His mind was a battlefield of its own, constantly assessing and adapting to the unfolding chaos. He was a master tactician, his decisions swift and decisive. Target the lead frigate! he ordered, his voice cutting through the din of battle. The Osiris's guns swiveled, locking onto the specified target. A salvo of missiles streaked through the darkness, their contrails leaving a fiery path. The missiles impacted the frigate, detonating with devastating force. The ship shuddered and broke apart, a brief flash of brilliance before the cold vacuum of space swallowed it. Convoy defenses are activating! Lieutenant Commander Kale reported, her fingers dancing over her console as she relayed new commands to the fleet. Maximus nodded, his eyes never leaving the display. Maintain formation. Do not let them regroup. The Putinese ships, now fully aware of the ambush, retaliated with ferocity. Energy beams and plasma projectiles crisscrossed the battlefield, illuminating the darkness with deadly intent. The Osiris's shields flared as they absorbed hit after hit, the ship's hull vibrating under the onslaught. Shields holding at 70%, reported Chief Engineer Marcus Harlan, a grizzled veteran with a no-nonsense attitude and a deep knowledge of starship systems. Reallocate power from non-essential systems, Maximus instructed, his voice calm despite the escalating danger. We need to maintain our offensive. As the battle intensified, the Osiris maneuvered through the chaos with remarkable agility. Maximus's leadership was evident in every movement, every calculated strike. His crew, loyal and highly trained, responded to his commands with unwavering precision. Enemy reinforcements inbound, Ensign Dre announced, his eyes widening as new blips appeared on the display. Maximus's jaw tightened. We need to finish this quickly. Focus fire on their command ship. The Osiris's weapons blazed once more, converging on the designated target. The command ship, a massive cruiser bristling with guns, took the brunt of the assault. Its shields flickered and failed, leaving it vulnerable to the relentless barrage. 
Direct hit, Lieutenant Commander Kale exclaimed, a rare note of triumph in her voice. The command ship erupted in a series of explosions, its structure disintegrating under the sustained fire. The destruction sent shock waves through the enemy fleet, sowing confusion and chaos. Now's our chance, Maximus said, seizing the moment. All units, press the attack. The fleet surged forward, their weapons tearing into the disoriented Putinese ships. One by one, the enemy vessels succumbed to the onslaught, their remains scattered across the battlefield like so much cosmic debris. Amidst the destruction, the Osiris remained a beacon of unyielding resolve. Maximus stood on the bridge, his gaze steely and determined. The battle was far from over, but this victory was a crucial step in his relentless quest for vengeance. As the last enemy ship was neutralized, a grim silence settled over the battlefield. The stars once more were the only witnesses to the aftermath of the conflict. Maximus took a deep breath his mind already turning to the next battle, the next step in his unending war against the Putinese. Status report, he demanded, his voice breaking the silence. All enemy vessels have been neutralized, Lieutenant Commander Kale reported, her eyes meeting his with a mixture of relief and respect. Minimal damage to our fleet, no casualties. Maximus nodded, his expression hardening. Good, prepare the fleet for immediate redeployment. We can't afford to lose momentum. As the crew sprang into action, Maximus allowed himself a moment to reflect. Each victory brought him closer to his goal, but it also served as a stark reminder of what he had lost. Patrick's face, his bright eyes, and infectious smile flashed through his mind. The pain was a constant companion, driving him forward with a relentless fury. Emperor Tabone, he muttered under his breath, his voice laced with venom. Your days are numbered. The Osiris and its fleet, now a symbol of rebellion and hope, prepared to move on. The spark of rebellion had been ignited, and there was no turning back. The galaxy would soon know the name Maximus Primus, and they would tremble in fear of his wrath. Chapter 2 Allies and Adversaries The aftermath of the ambush had left the crew of the Osiris with a mix of relief and urgency. Maximus Primus stood at the helm, his mind already focused on the next phase of their rebellion. The victory over the Putinese convoy had sent ripples throughout the galaxy, drawing the attention of potential allies and enemies alike. It was time to build a coalition strong enough to challenge Emperor Tabone's tyranny. The Council of Allies The Osiris docked at a secret rendezvous point in the asteroid belt of the Zora system. The hidden base, carved into the side of a massive asteroid, served as a temporary sanctuary for those who dared to defy the Putinese. Inside the base, representatives from various factions gathered in a large, dimly lit chamber. Maximus entered the room, his presence commanding immediate attention. His steely gaze swept over the assembly, taking in the diverse array of beings. Each one had their reasons for being there, but all shared a common goal— to see the downfall of Emperor Tabone. Thank you all for coming, Maximus began, his voice resonating with authority. We face a common enemy, and together, we have the strength to overcome him. Among the attendees was General Aaron Valeria of the Earth Federation. Valeria was a tall, imposing woman with short-cropped silver hair and piercing blue eyes. Her reputation as a brilliant strategist and fierce warrior preceded her. She had known Maximus from their days in the Federation and had a deep respect for his capabilities. Maximus, Valeria said, her voice firm but respectful, your victories have inspired many. The Federation is prepared to offer support, but we need assurances. What is your plan? Maximus nodded, acknowledging her concerns. Our plan is twofold, to weaken the Putinese hold on their territories through targeted strikes and to build an alliance strong enough to challenge their main forces. We must also rally the oppressed and win their support. Standing next to Valeria was Ambassador Ryler of the Aryan Confederacy, a coalition of planets inhabited by a race of amphibious humanoids. Rylor's skin had a slight iridescent sheen, and his large reflective eyes missed nothing. The Aryans had long been under the thumb of the Putinese, their resources exploited, and their people oppressed. We Aryans have suffered greatly under Tabone's rule. Rylor said, his voice smooth and melodic. 
We seek freedom and justice, but our people are wary of another war. How can we be sure this rebellion will succeed? Maximus looked directly at Ryler, his expression sincere. Because we fight for more than just revenge. We fight for a future where all can live without fear. We have the skills, the knowledge, and the determination to succeed. But we need your support to make it happen. A murmur of agreement spread through the chamber. Next to speak was Commander Takara of the Voth, a reptilian species known for their formidable strength and combat prowess. Takara's scales shimmered in shades of green and gold, and her yellow eyes gleamed with a predatory intelligence. The Voth have no love for the Putanese, Takara hissed. Our warriors are ready to join your cause, but we demand respect and a share in the spoils of victory. Maximus met her gaze without flinching. Respect is earned on the battlefield, Commander. Fight with us and you'll have my respect. As for the spoils, our goal is to free the oppressed and rebuild what has been destroyed. There will be plenty for all who help achieve that goal. Takara's lips curled into a semblance of a smile. Very well, Primus. We will fight alongside you. The final speaker was Captain Ilara Trent, a human pirate leader who had once been a thorn in the side of the Federation, but now saw an opportunity in the rebellion. She was a striking woman with a sharp wit and a reputation for cunning. Her long, dark hair flowed freely, and her eyes sparkled with mischief. I like your style, Maximus, Ilara said with a smirk. Count me and my crew in, but know this, we'll do things our way. Don't expect us to follow orders blindly. Maximus nodded, a hint of a smile on his lips. I wouldn't dream of it, Captain. Just bring your firepower and your cunning. We'll need both. With the alliances secured, Maximus turned to the practicalities of their rebellion. We have much to do and little time. Our first target will be the Putinese supply lines. Disrupting their logistics will weaken their ability to respond to our attacks. Tension Among Allies as the newly formed alliance began to work together, tensions inevitably arose. Each faction had its own priorities and methods, leading to frequent clashes and disagreements. General Valeria and Commander Takara often found themselves at odds over tactical approaches. Valeria preferred meticulous planning and precise strikes, while Takara favored direct, overwhelming assaults. You can't just charge into battle without a plan. Valeria argued during a strategy meeting. We need to outthink them, not just outfight them. Takara's eyes flashed with irritation. And while we're thinking, the enemy regroups and strengthens. Sometimes brute force is the answer. Maximus intervened, his tone calm but authoritative. We need both strategy and strength. Valeria, your planning will guide our major operations. Takara, your forces will be our spearhead. Together we can adapt and overcome. Ambassador Rylor faced his own challenges. His people were peace-loving by nature, and convincing them to take up arms was no easy task. He spent long hours in negotiations, trying to rally support while maintaining the moral high ground. We must remember why we fight, Rylor urged during a council meeting, not for conquest but for freedom. We must be better than our enemies. Ilara Trent, meanwhile, found herself chafing under the constraints of alliance warfare. Used to the independence of piracy, she struggled with the need for coordination and cooperation. Look, I didn't sign up to be part of some military machine, she complained to Maximus. My crew needs the freedom to operate as we see fit. Maximus listened patiently, understanding her perspective. I know it's not easy, Ilara, but your skills and your ships are crucial to our success. We need you and we need you to work with us. Flexibility is key, but so is unity. Despite the friction, the alliance began to function more smoothly as mutual respect grew. Each member brought unique strengths to the table, and through collaboration, they forged a force to be reckoned with. The First Joint Operation The first major test of their alliance came with a mission to disrupt a critical Putinese supply depot located on the moon of Thalax. Intelligence had revealed that the depot was a key node in the Putinese logistics network, and crippling it would significantly hamper their war efforts. Maximus, Valeria, Takara, Rylor, and Alara gathered in the war room aboard the Osiris to finalize their plans. The depot is heavily fortified, Valeria began, pointing to a holographic map. We'll need a multi-pronged approach to take it down. We'll start with a diversion, Maximus said. 
Ilara, your pirates will hit their outer defenses, drawing their attention and resources. Ilara grinned. A distraction is my specialty. We'll make plenty of noise. While they're occupied, Ryler's forces will infiltrate the perimeter and disable their security systems, Maximus continued. Once the defenses are down, Takara's troops will storm the depot and secure the area. Takara nodded, her eyes gleaming with anticipation. We will crush them. Valeria and I will oversee the operation from here, Maximus concluded. We'll coordinate the different elements and provide support as needed. The plan was set, and the Alliance moved into action. Ilara's pirates struck first, their nimble ships darting in and out of the depot's defensive perimeter, causing chaos and confusion. Explosions lit up the night sky and alarms blared as the Putonis scrambled to respond. Meanwhile, Rylor's elite team of infiltrators slipped through the shadows, bypassing security checkpoints and hacking into the depot's mainframe. The tension was palpable as they worked quickly and quietly, disabling cameras and neutralizing guards. Security systems are down, Rylor reported, his voice steady despite the danger. Takara, you're clear to move in. Takara's troops, a formidable force of heavily armed Voth warriors, charged into the depot with a ferocity that took the defenders by surprise. The sound of energy weapons and the clash of combat echoed through the facility as they pressed forward, overcoming resistance with sheer force. Maximus and Valeria monitored the operation from the war room, issuing commands and adjusting tactics as needed. The coordination was seamless, a testament to the growing unity of their alliance. Keep up the pressure, Valeria urged. We can't let them regroup. As the battle raged, Maximus couldn't help but feel a sense of pride in their progress. They were no longer just a ragtag group of rebels. They were a force to be reckoned with, a beacon of hope for those oppressed by the Putinese. The tide of the battle turned decisively in their favor. Takara's warriors secured the depot, and the remaining Putinese forces either surrendered or fled. Chapter 3 The Emperor's Wrath The Emperor's Chamber Deep within the imposing palace on the Putinese home world, Emperor Tabone sat on his ornate throne, his insectoid eyes glinting with a mixture of fury and malevolence. The recent string of defeats at the hands of Maximus Primus and his growing alliance had ignited a rage within him that threatened to consume all reason. The throne room, an extravagant display of the Putinese wealth and power, was filled with courtiers, advisors, and military officers, all of whom kept a wary distance from their volatile ruler. The walls were adorned with intricate carvings and precious metals, and the air was thick with the scent of exotic flowers and incense. Tabone's claws tapped rhythmically on the armrest of his throne, the only sound in the otherwise silent chamber. His advisors waited in tense anticipation, knowing that any misstep could result in severe punishment. How is it possible that a ragtag group of rebels has managed to disrupt our operations so effectively? Tabone's voice, a low, menacing hiss, broke the silence. General Dravis, a high-ranking military officer with a reputation for brutality, stepped forward. His posture was rigid, and his eyes, a deep shade of crimson, betrayed his nervousness. Your Excellency, they have proven to be more resourceful and coordinated than we anticipated. Their leader, Maximus Primus, is a formidable strategist. Tabone's eyes narrowed. Resourceful and coordinated? Those are excuses, General. I want results, not explanations. Dravis swallowed hard, his mandibles clicking anxiously. Yes, Your Excellency. We are intensifying our efforts to locate and destroy their bases. Our intelligence network is working tirelessly to gather information on their movements. Tabone's gaze shifted to another advisor, Minister Selix who oversaw the Empire's internal security. Selix was a cunning and ruthless figure, known for his ability to root out dissent with brutal efficiency. And what of our internal security, Minister? How is it that these rebels have been able to gain support among our own people? Selix bowed his head, his antennae twitching nervously. Your Excellency, we are conducting extensive purges to eliminate any potential sympathizers. We have already detained numerous suspects and are interrogating them to uncover further leads. Tabone's claws dug into the armrest, leaving deep gouges in the polished surface. It is not enough. I want this rebellion crushed and I want it done now. Mobilize our forces. Show no mercy to anyone found aiding the rebels. Let them see the price of defiance.
The Emperor's decree sent a shiver through the assembled advisors and officers. They knew that the coming days would be marked by bloodshed and terror, as Tabone unleashed his wrath upon both his enemies and his own people. The Brutal Crackdown Across the Putinese territories, the Emperor's orders were carried out with ruthless efficiency. The once bustling streets of the capital city, Creeks, were now patrolled by heavily armed soldiers their presence a constant reminder of Tabone's iron grip. Curfews were imposed, and citizens lived in fear of being accused of aiding the rebellion. In the rural regions and smaller settlements, the crackdown was even more severe. Villages suspected of harboring rebels were razed to the ground, their inhabitants either executed or taken as prisoners. The Putonese military, known for its discipline and brutality, left no stone unturned in their hunt for Maximus and his allies. The oppressive atmosphere weighed heavily on the populace. Whispers of dissent were quickly silenced, and the once vibrant culture of the Putinese people was stifled under the weight of fear and oppression. Those who dared to speak out against the emperor's tyranny were met with swift and merciless retribution. Maximus's Guerrilla Tactics Despite the increased danger, Maximus and his forces continued their campaign with relentless determination. They knew that direct confrontation with the Putinese military would be suicide, so they resorted to guerrilla tactics, striking at key installations and supply lines before vanishing into the shadows. Maximus stood in the command center of their hidden base, a cavernous facility deep within an asteroid field. The room buzzed with activity as his officers and advisors coordinated the next series of attacks. Holographic maps displayed the locations of their targets, and detailed plans were laid out with precision. Hit them where it hurts, Maximus instructed, his voice steady and resolute. Focus on their supply depots, communication hubs, and transport routes. We need to disrupt their operations and spread their forces thin. Lieutenant Commander Sarah Kale, always by his side, nodded in agreement. Our intelligence reports indicate that the Putinese are moving significant resources to fortify their positions. If we can intercept their supply convoys, it will hamper their ability to respond effectively. Ensign Victor Dre, his analytical mind constantly at work, added, We've identified several key supply routes that are lightly defended. Coordinated strikes on these convoys will not only disrupt their logistics, but also force them to divert resources to protect their supply lines. Maximus nodded, his mind already envisioning the chaos they would unleash. Prepare the strike teams. We'll launch a series of simultaneous attacks to maximize the impact. The next few days were a whirlwind of activity. Maximus's forces struck with precision and speed, hitting multiple targets across the Putinese territories. Supply depots erupted in flames, communication hubs were rendered inoperable, and transport convoys were ambushed and destroyed. Each victory, though small in isolation, sent a powerful message. The rebellion was far from defeated. The Putinese military, stretched thin and constantly on edge, struggled to maintain control. Reports of rebel attacks spread fear and uncertainty among the ranks, and morale began to waver. The Emperor's Fury News of the continued rebel successes reached Emperor Tabone, further fueling his rage. He convened an emergency meeting with his top advisors and military commanders, determined to stamp out the rebellion once and for all. The throne room, now a place of fear and tension, echoed with the emperor's furious voice. How can this be happening? How can a band of rebels continue to defy my rule? General Dravis, already under immense pressure, struggled to find the right words. Your Excellency, they are masters of guerrilla warfare. They strike quickly and disappear before we can respond. Our forces are spread thin, trying to defend multiple targets. Tabone's eyes blazed with fury. Then we must change our strategy. I want every available resource dedicated to finding their base of operations. Use any means necessary, and when we find them, I want them obliterated. Minister Selix, ever the schemer, stepped forward. Your Excellency, perhaps we can use their own tactics against them. Plant false information, set traps, and lure them into ambushes. If we can outthink them, we can crush them. Tabone considered Selix's proposal, his anger slowly giving way to cold calculation. Very well. Implement your plan, Minister. But remember, failure is not an option. The Putinese military, now under orders to employ more cunning and deceptive tactics, began laying traps and spreading disinformation. 
They hoped to catch the rebels off guard and deliver a decisive blow. The Rebellion's Response Maximus, ever vigilant, was aware of the changing tactics. His network of spies and informants kept him informed of the Putinese movements and strategies. He knew that the stakes were higher than ever, and any misstep could spell disaster for their cause. We need to stay one step ahead, Maximus said during a strategy meeting. Celix is a cunning opponent, and he'll try to outmaneuver us. We must be adaptable and unpredictable. Lieutenant Commander Kale agreed. We'll need to rotate our bases of operation frequently and vary our attack patterns. We can't afford to be predictable. Ensign Dre suggested another approach. We can feed them false information as well. If we can make them believe we're targeting certain locations, we can lead them into traps of our own. Maximus nodded, a grim smile forming on his lips. Let's turn their own tactics against them. We'll play this game on our terms. The rebels began a campaign of misdirection, spreading false information and setting up ambushes for the Putinese forces. The cat and mouse game that ensued tested the wits and resolve of both sides. But Maximus's forces proved to be more than a match for their adversaries. In one particularly daring operation, the rebels lured a Putinese battalion into a narrow canyon, only to detonate charges that caused a rock slide, trapping and destroying the enemy forces. The victory was a significant morale boost for the rebels, and a devastating blow to the Putinese. A Ray of Hope Amidst the relentless conflict, there were moments of hope and camaraderie that sustained the rebellion. Maximus's leadership inspired loyalty and determination, and the bonds formed among the diverse members of the Alliance grew stronger with each passing day. During a rare moment of respite, Maximus gathered his closest advisors and allies in the mess hall of their hidden base. The atmosphere was a mix of exhaustion and determination, but also a sense of unity and purpose. We've come a long way, Maximus said, raising a glass in a toast. We've faced unimaginable challenges and made incredible sacrifices. But our fight is far from over. We will continue to resist, to strike, and to fight for our freedom and the future of our people. Lieutenant Commander Kale, ever the stalwart supporter, added, Together we are stronger than they could ever imagine, and we will not rest until we see the end of Emperor Tabone's tyranny. The room erupted in cheers and applause, a testament to the unbreakable spirit of the rebellion. They knew that the road ahead would be fraught with danger and hardship, but they were prepared to face it with unwavering resolve. As Maximus looked around the room, he felt a renewed sense of hope. They were not just fighting for revenge, they were fighting for a better future. And with each victory, they moved one step closer to achieving that goal. Epilogue. The Emperor's Next Move. Back on the Putinese homeworld, Emperor Tabone brooded in his chamber, his mind racing with plans to crush the rebellion. He knew that Maximus Primus was a formidable foe, but he also knew that every rebel could be broken, every resistance crushed. As he gazed out at the sprawling city below, a sinister smile formed on his lips. He would stop at nothing to maintain his power, and he was prepared to unleash his full wrath upon the galaxy to do so. The rebellion was far from over, and the stage was set for an epic clash between the forces of tyranny and the champions of freedom. The fate of countless worlds hung in the balance, and the final battle was drawing ever closer. This chapter delves deep into the cruelty of Emperor Tabone, the resilience of Maximus's forces, and the intricate dance of strategy and deception that defines their conflict. The vivid descriptions and emotional depth continue to draw readers into the heart of the story, making them feel as though they are part of the epic struggle unfolding before them. The aftermath of the ambush had left the crew of the Osiris with a mix of relief and urgency. Maximus Primus stood at the helm, his mind already focused on the next phase of their rebellion. The victory over the Putinese convoy had sent ripples throughout the galaxy, drawing the attention of potential allies and enemies alike. It was time to build a coalition strong enough to challenge Emperor Tabone's tyranny. The Council of Allies the Osiris docked at a secret rendezvous point in the asteroid belt of the Zora system. The hidden base, 
carved into the side of a massive asteroid, served as a temporary sanctuary for those who dared to defy the Putinese. Inside the base, representatives from various factions gathered in a large, dimly lit chamber. Maximus entered the room, his presence commanding immediate attention. His steely gaze swept over the assembly, taking in the diverse array of beings. Each one had their reasons for being there, but all shared a common goal, to see the downfall of Emperor Tabone. Thank you all for coming, Maximus began, his voice resonating with authority. We face a common enemy, and together we have the strength to overcome him. Among the attendees was General Aaron Valeria of the Earth Federation. Valeria was a tall, imposing woman with short-cropped silver hair and piercing blue eyes. Her reputation as a brilliant strategist and fierce warrior preceded her. She had known Maximus from their days in the Federation and had a deep respect for his capabilities. Maximus, Valeria said, her voice firm but respectful. Your victories have inspired many. The Federation is prepared to offer support, but we need assurances. What is your plan? Maximus nodded, acknowledging her concerns. Our plan is twofold. To weaken the Putonese hold on their territories through targeted strikes and to build an alliance strong enough to challenge their main forces. We must also rally the oppressed and win their support. Standing next to Valeria was Ambassador Rylor of the Aryan Confederacy, a coalition of planets inhabited by a race of amphibious humanoids. Rylor's skin had a slight iridescent sheen, and his large, reflective eyes missed nothing. The Aryans had long been under the thumb of the Putonese, their resources exploited and their people oppressed. We Aryans have suffered greatly under Tabone's rule, Rylor said, his voice smooth and melodic. We seek freedom and justice, but our people are wary of another war. How can we be sure this rebellion will succeed? Maximus looked directly at Rylor, his expression sincere. Because we fight for more than just revenge, we fight for a future where all can live without fear. We have the skills, the knowledge, and the determination to succeed, but we need your support to make it happen. A murmur of agreement spread through the chamber. Next to speak was Commander Takara of the Voth, a reptilian species known for their formidable strength and combat prowess. Takara's scales shimmered in shades of green and gold, and her yellow eyes gleamed with a predatory intelligence. The Voth have no love for the Putinese, Takara hissed. Our warriors are ready to join your cause, but we demand respect and a share in the spoils of victory. Maximus met her gaze without flinching. Respect is earned on the battlefield, Commander. Fight with us, and you'll have my respect. As for the spoils, our goal is to free the oppressed and rebuild what has been destroyed. There will be plenty for all who help achieve that goal. Takara's lips curled into a semblance of a smile. Very well, Primus, we will fight alongside you. The final speaker was Captain Alara Trent, a human pirate leader who had once been a thorn in the side of the Federation, but now saw an opportunity in the rebellion. She was a striking woman with a sharp wit and a reputation for cunning. Her long, dark hair flowed freely and her eyes sparkled with mischief. I like your style, Maximus, Alara said with a smirk. Count me and my crew in. But know this, we'll do things our way. Don't expect us to follow orders blindly. Maximus nodded, a hint of a smile on his lips. I wouldn't dream of it, Captain. Just bring your firepower and your cunning. We'll need both. With the alliances secured, Maximus turned to the practicalities of their rebellion. We have much to do and little time. Our first target will be the Putinese supply lines. Disrupting their logistics will weaken their ability to respond to our attacks. Tension among allies. As the newly formed alliance began to work together, tensions inevitably arose. Each faction had its own priorities and methods, leading to frequent clashes and disagreements. General Valeria and Commander Takara often found themselves at odds over tactical approaches. Valeria preferred meticulous planning and precise strikes, while Takara favored direct, overwhelming assaults. You can't just charge into battle without a plan, Valeria argued during a strategy meeting. We need to outthink them, not just outfight them. Takara's eyes flashed with irritation, and while we're thinking, the enemy regroups and strengthens. Sometimes brute force is the answer. Maximus intervened, his tone calm but authoritative. We need both strategy and strength. Valeria, your planning will guide our major operations. 
Takara, your forces will be our spearhead. Together we can adapt and overcome. Ambassador Ryler faced his own challenges. His people were peace-loving by nature, and convincing them to take up arms was no easy task. He spent long hours in negotiations, trying to rally support while maintaining the moral high ground. We must remember why we fight, Rylor urged during a council meeting. Not for conquest, but for freedom. We must be better than our enemies. Elara Trent, meanwhile, found herself chafing under the constraints of alliance warfare. Used to the independence of piracy, she struggled with the need for coordination and cooperation. Look, I didn't sign up to be part of some military machine, she complained to Maximus. My crew needs the freedom to operate as we see fit. Maximus listened patiently, understanding her perspective. I know it's not easy, Alara, but your skills and your ships are crucial to our success. We need you, and we need you to work with us. Flexibility is key, but so is unity. Despite the friction, the alliance began to function more smoothly as mutual respect grew. Each member brought unique strengths to the table, and through collaboration, they forged a force to be reckoned with. Chapter 4. Escalation. The Putoni's Military Buildup. The Putoni's empire, stung by the growing threat of Maximus Primus and his alliance, began a massive military buildup. Emperor Tabone's orders were clear. Prepare for full-scale war. Across the empire, factories ramped up production, churning out weapons, ships, and equipment at an unprecedented rate. Recruitment drives swelled the ranks of the Putonese military, bringing in new soldiers eager to defend their homeland, or fearful of the consequences of refusal. The sprawling capital of Creeks became a hive of activity, with soldiers marching in formation, engineers working tirelessly on new technologies, and fleets of warships launching from orbiting shipyards. The atmosphere was one of grim determination, underscored by the ever-present fear of Emperor Tabone's wrath. In a vast underground command center, General Dravis stood before a holographic map, outlining the Empire's strategy to a group of high-ranking officers. His expression was severe, his voice resolute. Our objective is to crush the rebellion once and for all, Dravis declared. We will deploy our forces to key sectors, fortify our positions, and launch a series of coordinated assaults to eliminate the insurgents. We will show no mercy. The officers nodded in agreement, their faces set with determination. The Putinese military machine was mobilizing, and they intended to unleash its full might upon Maximus and his allies. Maximus's response in the hidden base within the Zora system, Maximus Primus and his inner circle gathered to assess the latest intelligence reports. The mood was tense but focused, as they understood the enormity of the challenge ahead. Lieutenant Commander Sarah Kale, her eyes sharp and determined, addressed the group. The Putinese are preparing for full-scale war. Their buildup is massive, and their forces are mobilizing across multiple sectors. We need to be ready for anything. Maximus nodded, his expression grim but resolute. We may be outnumbered, but we have the advantage of superior tactics and knowledge of the terrain. We must use every resource at our disposal to outmaneuver them. Ensign Victor Dre, ever the strategist, added, Our best chance is to continue our guerrilla tactics. We can disrupt their supply lines, sabotage their infrastructure, and weaken their forces through targeted strikes. If we can keep them off balance, we can create opportunities to strike decisive blows. Ambassador Rylor, his amphibious features reflecting the light of the holographic display, spoke up. We must also rally the oppressed populations within the Putinese Empire. Their support can provide us with critical intelligence and aid. Commander Takara, her reptilian eyes gleaming with a fierce determination, hissed, Our warriors are ready. We will strike swiftly and without mercy. Captain Alara Trent, leaning back with a casual confidence, grinned. And my crew will hit them where it hurts. We'll make sure they regret ever crossing us. Despite the friction, the alliance began to function more smoothly as mutual respect grew. Each member brought unique strengths to the table, and through collaboration, they forged a force to be reckoned with. The First Major Battle the Alliance's first major operation in response to the Putinese buildup was an ambitious strike against a heavily fortified supply depot on the moon of Thalax. Intelligence had revealed that the depot was a key node in the Putinese logistics network, 
and crippling it would significantly hamper their war efforts. The operation began with a series of coordinated attacks designed to divert the Putinese attention. Ilara Trent's pirates launched hit-and-run raids on outlying defenses, drawing enemy forces away from the main target. Meanwhile, Ryler's infiltrators slipped through the shadows, planting explosives and sabotaging key systems. As the diversionary attacks unfolded, Maximus and Takara led a combined force in a daring assault on the depot itself. The Osiris and a fleet of allied ships engaged the Petoni's defenses in orbit, unleashing a barrage of laser fire and missiles that lit up the darkness of space. On the ground, Takara's warriors stormed the depot with brutal efficiency. Energy weapons crackled, and the air was filled with the sounds of battle as they clashed with the Putinese defenders. Maximus fought at the forefront, his presence inspiring his comrades and striking fear into the hearts of his enemies. Amidst the chaos, Maximus spotted a high-ranking Putonese officer directing the defense. Recognizing an opportunity, he signaled to Takara. Take their command post. Without leadership, their defense will crumble. Takara nodded, her eyes flashing with predatory intent. Consider it done. With Takara leading the charge, the Allied forces pushed forward, cutting through the enemy lines with relentless determination. The Putinese defenders, already disoriented by the coordinated assault, struggled to regroup. Within minutes, Takara's warriors breached the command post, and the officer fell in a hail of blaster fire. As the depot's defenses crumbled, Maximus directed his forces to secure the facility and destroy any remaining supplies. Explosions rocked the depot, and the once imposing structure was reduced to a smoking ruin. Mission accomplished, Maximus declared his voice carrying a note of triumph. Withdraw to the rendezvous point. We've dealt them a significant blow today. The victory at Thalax was a crucial moment for the rebellion, proving that they could stand against the might of the Putinese military. But it was only the beginning of a long and arduous campaign. The Tide Turns In the wake of the Thalax operation, the Putinese Empire redoubled its efforts to crush the rebellion. Emperor Tabone's fury knew no bounds, and he unleashed his military with ruthless determination. Massive fleets of warships patrolled the Empire's territories, hunting for any sign of the insurgents. Ground forces swept through villages and towns, conducting brutal searches and executing suspected rebels without trial. The oppression was relentless, and fear gripped the population. But Maximus and his allies were undeterred. They adapted their tactics, using their superior knowledge of the terrain and their understanding of the Putinese weaknesses to stay one step ahead. In one daring operation, the rebels launched a series of hit-and-run attacks on a convoy, transporting critical supplies to the front lines. Elara's pirates struck first, disabling the convoy's escorts and sowing confusion. Ryler's infiltrators then moved in, sabotaging the convoy's engines and rendering it immobile. As the convoy ground to a halt, Maximus and Takara led a swift and decisive assault. The Putinese guards, caught off guard and outnumbered, were quickly overwhelmed. The supplies, intended to bolster the Empire's war effort, were either destroyed or confiscated by the rebels. The success of these operations began to shift the tide of the war. The Putonese military, once confident in its superiority, found itself increasingly stretched thin and demoralized. Reports of rebel attacks spread fear and uncertainty among the ranks, and morale began to waver. The Cost of War Despite their successes, the rebellion was not without its costs. Each victory came at a price, and the toll of the war weighed heavily on Maximus and his comrades. One evening, as the Alliance regrouped at their hidden base, Maximus stood on a balcony overlooking the asteroid field. The stars shone brightly above, a stark contrast to the darkness of the conflict below. Lieutenant Commander Kale joined him, her expression somber. We've lost good people, Maximus. Friends, allies. Sometimes it feels like the war will never end. Maximus sighed, his eyes reflecting the weariness of a man who had seen too much. I know, Sarah, but we can't afford to lose hope. Every sacrifice brings us closer to our goal. We fight for those who cannot and we must see it through to the end. Kale nodded, her resolve firming. You're right, we can't give up now. As they stood in silence, reflecting on the challenges ahead, 
a message came through on their communicators. It was from a contact within the Putinese military, a disillusioned officer who had secretly provided valuable intelligence. Maximus, we've received word that the Putinese are planning a major offensive. They're amassing a fleet at the edge of the Drakon system. If we can intercept them, we might be able to turn the tide even further. Maximus's eyes narrowed. Then that's where we'll strike next. We need to gather our forces and prepare for battle. The Battle of Draken The Battle of Draken would prove to be one of the most pivotal engagements of the war. The Putinese fleet, commanded by a seasoned admiral, was poised to launch a decisive strike against the rebellion. But Maximus and his allies had other plans. The Alliance's fleet, though smaller in number, was bolstered by their superior tactics and the element of surprise. As the Putinese fleet entered the Dracon system, they found themselves ambushed by a well-coordinated rebel force. The space around Dracon erupted in a storm of laser fire and explosions. The Osiris led the charge, its weapon systems delivering precise and devastating strikes. Maximus directed the battle from the bridge, his commands turning the tide in favor of the rebels. Focus fire on their flagship, Maximus ordered, his voice calm amidst the chaos. If we can take out their command, the rest of the fleet will falter. The Allied ships concentrated their firepower on the Putinese flagship, a massive dreadnought bristling with weapons. The intense barrage overwhelmed its shields, and the ship shuddered under the relentless assault. As the flagship began to break apart, panic spread through the Putinese fleet. Their coordination faltered, and the Federation forces seized the opportunity to press the attack. One by one, the enemy ships fell, their wreckage drifting aimlessly in the void. On the ground, Federation troops, bolstered by Takara's warriors and Rylor's infiltrators, stormed the Putinese installations. The fighting was fierce, but the combined might of the Allied forces proved overwhelming. The Putonese defenders, demoralized by the loss of their fleet, offered little resistance. With the Dracon system secured, the Alliance turned its attention to other key sectors. The campaign was relentless, each victory bringing them closer to their ultimate goal, the fall of Emperor Tabon. Devastating Losses Despite the successes, the war continued to take a heavy toll on both sides. The Putinese, driven to desperation, launched a series of retaliatory strikes on Federation worlds. These attacks, though less coordinated than before, were no less deadly. On the planet Ganymede, a bustling hub of commerce and culture, the Putinese attack came with a ferocity that left the populace reeling. Warships descended upon the city, unleashing a torrent of destruction that reduced entire districts to rubble. Maximus and his fleet arrived too late to prevent the initial assault, but they quickly moved to engage the enemy. The Osiris led the charge, its weapons blazing as it tore through the Putinese ships. We can't let them do this again, Maximus muttered, his eyes blazing with fury. We need to end this war once and for all. The battle for Ganymede was brutal and costly. Federation soldiers fought valiantly to protect the civilians, but the damage was already done. The city's once vibrant streets were now filled with the wreckage of war and the cries of the wounded. General Valeria, her silver hair stained with blood and soot, stood among the ruins, her heart heavy with sorrow. We will rebuild, she vowed, her voice barely above a whisper. We will honor the fallen by continuing to fight. Maximus, seeing the devastation firsthand, felt the weight of responsibility pressing down on him. He knew that the war was far from over, but he also knew that they could not afford to waver. The lives of countless innocents depended on their resolve. Rallying the Troops In the aftermath of the battles, Maximus took the opportunity to rally his troops and renew their determination. Standing before a gathering of soldiers, pilots, and civilians, he spoke with a passion that ignited the hearts of all who heard him. We have faced unimaginable horrors, Maximus began, his voice carrying over the assembled crowd. We have seen our homes destroyed, our loved ones taken from us. But we are still here, we are still fighting, and we will not stop until the Putonese Empire is brought to its knees. The crowd erupted in cheers, their spirits lifted by his words. Maximus continued, his voice growing stronger. 
We fight for freedom. We fight for justice. We fight for a future where our children can live without fear. The Putinese have shown us their true nature, and we will show them the strength of our resolve. Lieutenant Commander Kale, standing beside him, added her own voice to the rallying cry. We have the Federation's support. We have the might of our allies, and we have the will to see this through. Together we will win this war. The soldiers, their hearts filled with renewed determination, raised their weapons in salute. The civilians, their faith in the cause strengthened, joined in the chant. The rebellion had faced its darkest hours, but the light of hope still burned bright. Preparing for the final push. With the Federation's full support and the Alliance growing stronger by the day, Maximus and his commanders began to plan the final push against the Putinese Empire. The goal was clear. Take the fight to Emperor Tabone's doorstep and bring an end to his reign of terror. In the war room aboard the Osiris, Maximus, Valeria, Takara, Rylor, and Alara gathered to discuss their strategy. Holographic maps displayed the positions of their forces and the targets they needed to hit. We need to strike at the heart of their power, Maximus said, his eyes fixed on the map. The capital, Creeks is heavily fortified, but if we can break through their defenses, we can bring Tabone down. General Valeria nodded. We should coordinate simultaneous assaults on their major strongholds to divide their forces. Once their defenses are weakened, we can focus our efforts on Creeks. Rylor added, We have contacts within the Putinese military who are willing to provide us with intelligence. Their support could be crucial in planning our attacks. Takara, her eyes gleaming with determination, hissed, Our warriors are ready. We will strike swiftly and decisively. Elara grinned, her confidence unshaken, and my crew will make sure they never see it coming. With the plan in place, the Alliance began to prepare for the final push. Ships were armed, troops were mobilized, and the determination to end the war once and for all burned brightly in the hearts of all who fought for the cause. Epilogue. The Path Ahead. As the Alliance prepared for the decisive battles ahead, Maximus stood on the bridge of the Osiris, gazing out at the stars. The war had taken a heavy toll, but it had also brought together a coalition of forces united by a common goal. Lieutenant Commander Kale joined him, her expression one of quiet determination. We're ready, Maximus. The troops are motivated and the fleet is prepared. This is our chance to end it. Maximus nodded, his eyes reflecting the weight of his resolve. We will strike with everything we have. For Patrick, for all who have suffered, we will bring an end to Tabone's tyranny. The stars above seemed to shimmer with the promise of a new dawn. The path ahead was fraught with danger, but Maximus and his allies were prepared to face it head on. The final battle was drawing near, and the fate of the galaxy hung in the balance. Together, they would fight. Together, they would win, and together they would forge a future free from the shadows of oppression. Chapter 5 Striking Back The Earth Federation mobilizes the mounting threat posed by the Putinese and the growing success of Maximus's rebellion finally prompted the Earth Federation to take decisive action. Reports of the Putinese brutal crackdown and their relentless military buildup had reached the highest echelons of the Federation government. After intense deliberations, the Federation Council voted to mobilize its fleets and officially support Maximus Primus and his allies. In the heart of the Earth Federation's capital, a grand ceremony marked the formal declaration of war against the Putinese Empire. President Lucius Kane, a stalwart leader with a reputation for integrity and determination, addressed the assembled crowd and the galaxy at large. Today we stand united against tyranny. Cain declared, his voice echoing through the vast hall and across the airwaves. The Putinese Empire has shown its true nature through acts of brutality and oppression. We will not stand idly by while innocent lives are lost and freedom is trampled. Together with our allies, we will strike back and bring an end to Emperor Tabone's reign of terror. The speech was met with thunderous applause and renewed resolve. Federation warships, gleaming in the light of distant stars, began to mobilize. Fleets of battleships, cruisers, and carriers moved into formation, ready to join the fight. Reinforcements arrive. 
Maximus Primus stood on the bridge of the Osiris, watching as the first wave of Federation reinforcements arrived. The sight of the massive fleet, arrayed in perfect formation, filled him with a sense of hope and renewed determination. Federation forces are joining the battle, Lieutenant Commander Sarah Kale reported, her eyes shining with excitement. This changes everything, Maximus. We finally have the support we need. Maximus nodded, his expression a mix of relief and resolve. It's a game changer, Sarah, but we must remain vigilant. The Putinese will not back down easily. The Federation reinforcements brought not only additional firepower, but also a wealth of resources and personnel. Medical teams tended to the wounded, engineers repaired damaged ships, and fresh troops bolstered the ranks of the rebel forces. The combined might of the Alliance now stood ready to take the fight to the Putinese on an even larger scale. The Putinese desperation Emperor Tabone, infuriated by the Earth Federation's intervention, ordered a series of desperate attacks on human settlements. The goal was clear, to inflict maximum damage and sow fear among the civilian population, hoping to force the Federation to reconsider its involvement. The first wave of Putinese assaults targeted remote colonies and outposts on the fringes of Federation space. Warships descended upon unsuspecting settlements, unleashing devastating bombardments that reduced entire cities to rubble. The screams of the innocent echoed through the comm channels, a haunting reminder of the enemy's ruthlessness. On the planet New Avalon, a thriving human colony, the Putonis' attack came without warning. The skies darkened with enemy ships, their weapons tearing through the colony's defenses with merciless precision. Buildings crumbled, fires raged, and chaos reigned as the settlers struggled to survive. General Aaron Valeria, leading the Federation forces on New Avalon, fought valiantly to repel the invaders. Her silver hair glinted in the firelight, her eyes blazing with determination as she directed her troops. Hold the line, Valeria shouted her voice cutting through the din of battle. We cannot let them break us! Despite their best efforts, the Putinese overwhelming firepower took a heavy toll. Federation soldiers and civilians alike fell in the relentless assault, their blood mingling with the ashes of their homes. Maximus, monitoring the situation from the Osiris, felt a deep pang of sorrow and anger. He knew that the Putinese would stop at nothing to break their spirit, but he also knew that they could not afford to be deterred. We must strike back, Maximus said, his voice steely with resolve. For every life lost, we will make them pay tenfold. The Tide Turns The Putinese desperate attacks only served to galvanize the resolve of the Earth Federation and its allies. Maximus and his commanders devised a series of counteroffensives targeting key Putoni's strongholds and supply lines. The goal was to cripple their war machine and force them into a defensive posture. The first major counteroffensive took place in the Vortan system, a strategically important sector that housed several key Putoni's military installations. The Federation and Allied fleets converged on the system, ready to deliver a decisive blow. The battle began with a coordinated assault on the main Putoni's fleet guarding the sector. Federation battleships, bristling with weaponry, engaged the enemy head-on. Laser fire and missile trails crisscrossed the void, creating a deadly tapestry of destruction. Maximus, aboard the Osiris, led the charge. His ship darted through the chaos with unmatched agility, its weapon systems delivering precise and devastating strikes. The Putinese, caught off guard by the ferocity of the attack, struggled to maintain their formation. Focus fire on their flagship, Maximus commanded, his voice steady and authoritative. We take out their command and the rest will follow. The Allied ships converged on the Putinese flagship, a massive dreadnought bristling with guns. The intense barrage overwhelmed its shields and the ship shuddered under the relentless assault. Explosions erupted along its hull and it began to break apart. As the flagship disintegrated, panic spread through the Putinese fleet. Their coordination faltered, and the Federation forces seized the opportunity to press the attack. One by one, the enemy ships fell, their wreckage drifting aimlessly in the void. On the ground, Federation troops, bolstered by Takara's warriors and Rylor's infiltrators, stormed the Putinese installations. The fighting was fierce, but the combined might of the Allied forces proved overwhelming. 
The Putinese defenders, demoralized by the loss of their fleet, offered little resistance. With the Vortan system secured, the alliance turned its attention to other key sectors. The campaign was relentless, each victory bringing them closer to their ultimate goal, the fall of Emperor Tabon. Devastating Losses Despite the successes, the war continued to take a heavy toll on both sides. The Putinese, driven to desperation, launched a series of retaliatory strikes on Federation worlds. These attacks, though less coordinated than before, were no less deadly. On the planet Ganymede, a bustling hub of commerce and culture, the Putinese attack came with a ferocity that left the populace reeling. Warships descended upon the city, unleashing a torrent of destruction that reduced entire districts to rubble. Maximus and his fleet arrived too late to prevent the initial assault, but they quickly moved to engage the enemy. The Osiris led the charge, its weapons blazing as it tore through the Putinese ships. We can't let them do this again, Maximus muttered, his eyes blazing with fury. We need to end this war once and for all. The battle for Ganymede was brutal and costly. Federation soldiers fought valiantly to protect the civilians, but the damage was already done. The city's once vibrant streets were now filled with the wreckage of war and the cries of the wounded. General Valeria, her silver hair stained with blood and soot, stood among the ruins, her heart heavy with sorrow. We will rebuild, she vowed, her voice barely above a whisper. We will honor the fallen by continuing to fight. Maximus, seeing the devastation firsthand, felt the weight of responsibility pressing down on him. He knew that the war was far from over, but he also knew that they could not afford to waver. The lives of countless innocents depended on their resolve. Rallying the Troops In the aftermath of the battles, Maximus took the opportunity to rally his troops and renew their determination. Standing before a gathering of soldiers, pilots, and civilians, he spoke with a passion that ignited the hearts of all who heard him. We have faced unimaginable horrors. Maximus began, his voice carrying over the assembled crowd. We have seen our homes destroyed, our loved ones taken from us, but we are still here, we are still fighting, and we will not stop until the Putinese Empire is brought to its knees. The crowd erupted in cheers, their spirits lifted by his words. Maximus continued, his voice growing stronger. We fight for freedom. We fight for justice. We fight for a future where our children can live without fear. The Putinese have shown us their true nature, and we will show them the strength of our resolve. Lieutenant Commander Kale, standing beside him, added her own voice to the rallying cry. We have the Federation's support. We have the might of our allies, and we have the will to see this through. Together, we will win this war. The soldiers, their hearts filled with renewed determination, raised their weapons in salute. The civilians, their faith in the cause strengthened, joined in the chant. The rebellion had faced its darkest hours, but the light of hope still burned bright. Preparing for the final push. With the Federation's full support and the Alliance growing stronger by the day, Maximus and his commanders began to plan the final push against the Putinese Empire. The goal was clear. Take the fight to Emperor Tabone's doorstep and bring an end to his reign of terror. In the war room aboard the Osiris, Maximus, Valeria, Takara, Rylor, and Alara gathered to discuss their strategy. Holographic maps displayed the positions of their forces and the targets they needed to hit. We need to strike at the heart of their power, Maximus said, his eyes fixed on the map. The capital, Creeks, is heavily fortified, but if we can break through their defenses, we can bring Tabone down. General Valeria nodded. We should coordinate simultaneous assaults on their major strongholds to divide their forces. Once their defenses are weakened, we can focus our efforts on Creeks. Ryler added, We have contacts within the Putinese military who are willing to provide us with intelligence. Their support could be crucial in planning our attacks. Takara, her eyes gleaming with determination, hissed, Our warriors are ready. We will strike swiftly and decisively. Alara grinned, her confidence unshaken and my crew will make sure they never see it coming. With the plan in place, the Alliance began to prepare for the final push. Ships were armed, troops were mobilized, and the determination to end the war once and for all burned brightly in the hearts of all who fought for the cause.
Diplomatic Maneuvers The Proposal for Peace Talks the relentless war had taken a devastating toll on both sides. As the conflict dragged on, the Earth Federation, under the leadership of President Lucius Kane, saw an opportunity to attempt diplomacy with the Putinese Empire. The Federation Council agreed that while military strength was crucial, exploring all avenues for peace was necessary to save lives and resources. A proposal for peace talks was sent to Emperor Tabone. It was a bold move, fraught with risks but one that Kane believed was worth taking. The message was simple. Meet at a neutral location to discuss terms for ending the war. The response from Tabone came swiftly and surprisingly agreed to the talks, but with conditions that ensured his security and dominance. The chosen location was the neutral planet Elysium, known for its peaceful landscapes and impartiality in galactic conflicts. It was a world where many historic treaties had been signed, and it offered the promise of safety for both parties. The delegation Maximus Primus was chosen to lead the Federation delegation, a decision that stirred mixed emotions among the Council. While Maximus was a brilliant strategist and a symbol of resistance, his personal vendetta against Tabone was well known. However, Cain believed that Maximus's presence would send a strong message about the Federation's resolve. Joining Maximus were General Aaron Valeria, Ambassador Rylor, and a team of diplomats and security personnel. The tension was palpable as they prepared to embark on this precarious mission. Maximus's face was a mask of determination, his blue eyes burning with an intensity that belied his calm demeanor. You know why you were chosen, Maximus, Kane said during their final briefing. You represent our strength and our unwillingness to bow to tyranny. But remember, diplomacy requires restraint. We need a peaceful resolution if possible. Maximus nodded, though his thoughts were consumed by memories of his son Patrick and the atrocities committed by Tabone. I understand, Mr. President. I will do what is necessary for the Federation and for our future. The Tense Arrival The Osiris arrived at Elysium, its sleek form descending through the planet's atmosphere. The delegates disembarked, greeted by the serene beauty of the neutral world. Rolling hills and sparkling lakes contrasted sharply with the grim realities of war, creating an almost surreal environment for the talks. The Putinese delegation arrived shortly after, their ships casting ominous shadows over the landscape. Emperor Tabone led his delegation, flanked by his most trusted advisors, including General Dravis and Minister Selix. The Putinese emperor was an imposing figure, his insectoid features exuding arrogance and menace. The two delegations met in a grand hall designed for such diplomatic endeavors. The architecture was a blend of elegance and neutrality, with high ceilings, large windows, and an air of solemnity. As they took their seats, the tension in the room was palpable. Opening Statements President Kane opened the proceedings with a call for peace. We are here today to seek a resolution to this conflict that has cost countless lives. Let us find a way to coexist in peace and mutual respect. Emperor Tabone's response was cold and calculated. Peace is a noble goal, President Kane, but let us be clear, the Putonese Empire will not bow to threats or intimidation. We demand respect and recognition of our sovereignty. Maximus felt his blood boil at Tabone's words, but he kept his composure. The talks had just begun, and he knew that showing restraint was crucial. Behind Closed Doors As the formal talks proceeded, Maximus and Tabone were brought into a private chamber for more candid discussions. The air was thick with animosity as they faced each other, the past hanging heavily between them. You have caused a lot of trouble, Primus, Tabone said, his voice dripping with contempt. Your rebellion has cost many lives. Maximus's eyes blazed with anger. You talk about lives as if they matter to you, Tabone. How many innocents have you butchered? How many children have you sacrificed for your empire? Tabone's lips curled into a sneer. Collateral damage, the price of maintaining order, something you clearly do not understand. Maximus clenched his fists, struggling to keep his rage in check. I understand more than you think. I understand the value of freedom and the cost of tyranny, and I will not rest until you pay for what you've done. The tension was almost unbearable, but
but the presence of mediators and the weight of their responsibilities forced both men to restrain themselves. The Betrayal As the talks progressed, it became clear that Tabone had no intention of negotiating in good faith. His demands were outrageous, seeking to dismantle the Federation's alliances and impose heavy reparations. The Federation delegation countered with terms that aimed for mutual benefit and lasting peace, but Tabone's arrogance and disdain were evident. In a private meeting, Minister Selix approached Ambassador Ryler with a proposition. We can arrange a ceasefire, Selix suggested, his voice smooth and persuasive, but it will require certain concessions from your side. Think of the lives you could save. Ryler, ever the diplomat, considered the offer. What kind of concessions are you talking about? Selix leaned in closer. Withdrawal of your support for Maximus Primus. Turn him over to us and we can end this war. Rylor's eyes widened in shock. You can't be serious. Maximus is a hero, a symbol of our resistance. We would never betray him. Selix's smile was cold. Think carefully, Ambassador. The alternative is continued bloodshed. Is one man worth the lives of thousands? Ryler, though tempted by the prospect of peace, knew he could never betray Maximus. I will not entertain this any further. Our alliance stands firm. The exchange was reported back to Maximus, who felt a surge of pride and gratitude towards Ryler. However, it also reinforced his belief that Tabone could not be trusted. The Breaking Point as the talks dragged on, it became clear that they were reaching an impasse. The Putinese demands were unacceptable, and the Federation's patience was wearing thin. President Kane called for a final session, hoping to salvage something from the negotiations. We have offered reasonable terms, Kane stated firmly. We seek peace, but not at the cost of our principles. The Federation will not be bullied. Tabone's response was a thinly veiled threat. If you continue to defy us, you will face the full might of the Putinese Empire. There will be no mercy. Maximus, unable to contain his fury any longer, stood up. You speak of mercy as if you know its meaning. This war will end, Tabone, but not in the way you hope. We will fight for our freedom and for justice, and we will prevail. The room fell silent, the weight of Maximus's words hanging in the air. The delegates knew that the talks had failed and the prospect of a peaceful resolution was slipping away. Return to Battle As the delegations prepared to depart, Maximus and Tabone exchanged one final chilling glance. The war would continue, and the stakes were higher than ever. Back on the Osiris, Maximus addressed his troops. We tried diplomacy, and it failed. Now we return to what we know best, we will fight with all we have and we will bring an end to Tabone's tyranny. The soldiers, their spirits undaunted, cheered in response. They knew the road ahead would be difficult, but their resolve was unbreakable. The First Counterattack The failure of the peace talks galvanized the Federation and its allies. They launched a series of aggressive counterattacks, targeting key Putonese positions with renewed vigor. In the strategic Lornax system, a critical Putinese supply hub, Maximus led a daring raid. The Osiris and its fleet engaged the enemy forces, unleashing a devastating assault that crippled the Putinese logistics network. The battle was fierce, with explosions lighting up the void and the sounds of combat filling the comm channels. Maximus fought with a renewed intensity, his resolve unshaken by the failed diplomacy. Take out their command center he ordered, his voice cutting through the chaos. Without leadership, they will fall apart. The Allied forces pressed the attack, their coordinated strikes overwhelming the Putinese defenses. Within hours, the supply hub was in ruins, and the enemy forces were in full retreat, the path to victory. As the rebellion gained momentum, Maximus and his allies continued to strike at the heart of the Putinese Empire. Each victory brought them closer to their ultimate goal, the fall of Emperor Tabone. The failure of the peace talks had only strengthened their resolve. They knew that the path to victory would be long and arduous, but they were prepared to see it through to the end. Maximus, standing on the bridge of the Osiris, looked out at the stars. The war had cost them dearly, but it had also brought them together in a common cause. They were more than just soldiers. They were a symbol of hope and resistance.
We will fight, Maximus said, his voice filled with determination. For Patrick, for our fallen comrades, and for the future of the galaxy, we will fight and we will win. This chapter highlights the tension and drama of the failed peace talks, the deep-seated animosity between Maximus and Tabone, and the renewed determination of the Federation and its allies. The vivid descriptions and emotional depth draw readers deeper into the epic struggle, setting the stage for the climactic battles to come. Chapter 7. The Bounty The Rumor Spreads the war had reached a new level of intensity, and with the failure of the peace talks, Emperor Tabone sought to exploit every possible angle to crush the rebellion. Whispers began to circulate throughout the galaxy. Emperor Tabone had placed bounties on the heads of key figures in the Earth Federation and the Rebel Alliance. These bounties were not limited to military targets. Civilians associated with the Federation were also marked. The promise of riches and power drew bounty hunters and mercenaries from the darkest corners of space. These were not the honor-bound warriors of traditional armies, but ruthless opportunists who thrived on chaos and violence. The stakes were raised as this new element of danger brought chaos and distrust into Maximus's ranks. The Arrival of the Hunters the first sign of the bounty hunter's presence came when a Federation convoy, transporting medical supplies to a besieged colony, was ambushed. The attackers were a ragtag band of mercenaries, their ships bristling with mismatched weaponry. They attacked with brutal efficiency, leaving no survivors. Maximus received the distress signal too late to intervene. The sight of the destroyed convoy filled him with rage. They were carrying medical supplies, he growled, his fists clenched. These mercenaries are nothing but scum. Lieutenant Commander Sarah Kale, standing by his side, shared his fury. We need to find out who these bounty hunters are and stop them before they do more damage. As reports of similar attacks poured in, it became clear that the bounty hunters were targeting anyone connected to the rebellion. Their tactics were unpredictable, and their motivations were purely mercenary. The psychological toll on Maximus and his forces was immense. The fraying of trust. The presence of bounty hunters sowed seeds of distrust within the Alliance. Paranoia began to take hold as soldiers and civilians alike wondered who might be working with the enemy. Maximus knew that maintaining morale and unity was crucial, but it was a difficult task. In a secure meeting room aboard the Osiris, Maximus addressed his inner circle. General Aaron Valeria, Ambassador Rylor, Commander Takara and Captain Alara Trent were present, their faces etched with concern. We are facing a new kind of enemy, Maximus began. These bounty hunters have no loyalty, no cause. They are here for profit, and they will stop at nothing to claim their rewards. Valeria's eyes narrowed. We need to tighten our security. Anyone could be a target or a traitor. Rylor nodded. We must also be careful not to let paranoia consume us. If we turn on each other, we will do Tabona's work for him. Takara, ever the warrior, hissed, Let them come! We will show them what it means to face true warriors! Elara, her usual smirk absent, added, We need to be smart about this. Use their greed against them. Set traps, lure them in, Maximus agreed. We will do all of that, but we must also support our people. Fear and distrust are our greatest enemies now. We need to show them that we are strong and united. Psychological Toll The psychological toll of the bounty hunters' attacks began to manifest in various ways. Soldiers became more withdrawn, quick to anger, and less willing to trust even their closest comrades. The constant threat of betrayal hung over them like a dark cloud. One night, Maximus found himself unable to sleep. He wandered the corridors of the Osiris, his mind heavy with the burden of leadership. In the mess hall, he found Ensign Victor Dre sitting alone staring into his drink. Couldn't sleep either? Maximus asked, sitting down beside him. Dre shook his head. It's hard to sleep when you don't know who to trust. Every face looks like a potential enemy. Maximus sighed. I know, but we can't let fear control us. We have to be stronger than that. Dre looked up, his eyes filled with uncertainty. How do you do it, Maximus? How do you stay strong? Maximus's gaze hardened. I remember why I'm fighting. I think of Patrick, of all the innocent lives at stake. 
and I know that giving in to fear would mean failing them. We have to be better than our enemies. Dre nodded slowly. You're right. We can't give up. The bounty hunter's trap. The Alliance decided to take a proactive approach. Using intelligence gathered from their spies, they identified several bounty hunter groups operating in key sectors. The plan was to lure these mercenaries into traps, using false information and bait. In one such operation, Maximus and his team set up a decoy convoy in the Nix system, a remote area known for its asteroid fields. The convoy appeared to be carrying valuable supplies, but in reality, it was a heavily armed trap. Captain Alara Trent's ship, the Marauder, led the operation. Her crew, seasoned in deception and guerrilla tactics, played their roles perfectly. As expected, the bounty hunters took the bait, swooping in for what they believed would be an easy score. Incoming ships, Ilara reported, her voice calm. They're falling for it. Maximus, monitoring the operation from the Osiris, gave the signal. Engage the trap. Take them down. The decoy convoy's containers opened, revealing hidden cannons and fighters. A fierce battle erupted, with the Alliance forces overwhelming the bounty hunters. The mercenaries, caught off guard and outgunned, were quickly neutralized. The victory was a significant morale boost for the Alliance. Captured bounty hunters provided valuable intelligence on their operations and connections, allowing the Alliance to dismantle several more groups. The Toll on Maximus Despite the successes, the constant stress and personal vendetta against Tabone weighed heavily on Maximus. The burden of leadership, the fear of betrayal, and the loss of friends took their toll on him. One evening, as the Osiris orbited a serene, uninhabited planet for a brief respite, Maximus found himself alone on the observation deck. The vast expanse of space stretched out before him, a reminder of the enormity of their struggle. Lieutenant Commander Sarah Kale joined him, her presence a comforting anchor. You've been pushing yourself too hard, she said softly. Maximus didn't turn to face her. I can't afford to stop, not now. Sarah placed a hand on his shoulder. You're not alone in this, Maximus. We all carry this burden. You need to trust us, trust yourself. He finally looked at her, his eyes reflecting the weight of his emotions. It's just so much. Patrick, the war, the constant threat. Sometimes it feels like I'm losing myself in it. Sarah's gaze was steady. You're not losing yourself. You're finding your strength. And we're with you every step of the way. Maximus took a deep breath, feeling the tension ease slightly. Thank you, Sarah. I needed to hear that. Renewed Resolve The Alliance continued to face challenges, but the unity and strength of its members remained unbroken. The bounty hunters, though a persistent threat, could not shake their resolve. Maximus and his allies grew more determined with each passing day, their commitment to the cause unwavering. As the Osiris prepared for its next mission, Maximus addressed his troops. We face enemies who seek to divide us, to make us doubt each other. But we are stronger than that. We fight for a future free from tyranny, for justice, for those we love. Remember why we are here. Together we will overcome any challenge. The soldiers, inspired by his words, stood tall and ready. The path ahead was still fraught with danger, but their resolve was unbreakable. Maximus knew that the war was far from over, but he also knew that they were closer than ever to their goal. With renewed determination, he led his forces into the next phase of their epic struggle, confident that they would prevail. This chapter delves into the psychological toll of the war, the introduction of bounty hunters, and the impact of paranoia and distrust within the Alliance. The vivid descriptions of characters' emotions and the intense battle scenes draw readers deeper into the story, setting the stage for the climactic confrontations to come. Chapter 8. Raids and Retaliation. The Intensified Assault. The war entered a new and more brutal phase as the Putonese Empire intensified their raids, pushing deeper into Earth Federation territory. The raids were sudden, fierce, and devastating, targeting strategic locations and civilian centers alike. Emperor Tabone's strategy was clear, to break the spirit of the Federation and its allies by sowing chaos and fear. On the edge of Federation space, the colony of Terranova became one of the first major targets. 
The once thriving settlement, known for its lush landscapes and advanced research facilities, was caught off guard as a fleet of Putoni's warships descended upon it. The attack was swift and brutal. Buildings crumbled under the relentless bombardment, and the skies were filled with the screech of enemy fighters. The defenders, though brave, were overwhelmed by the sheer ferocity of the assault. Maximus Primus received the distress call while aboard the Osiris. His face hardened with resolve as he issued commands. Prepare the fleet. We move to Terra Nova immediately. Lieutenant Commander Sarah Kale, her expression grim, relayed the orders. All ships, ready for emergency jump. We need to get there as fast as possible. Within moments, the Osiris and its accompanying fleet leapt through hyperspace, hurtling toward the besieged colony, the battle for Terra Nova. The Osiris emerged from hyperspace above Terra Nova, its sensors immediately detecting the chaos below. The Putonese fleet was systematically destroying the colony, their warships raining destruction upon the defenseless civilians. Maximus wasted no time. Engage all enemy vessels. Protect the colony at all costs. The Federation fleet surged forward, weapons blazing. The void of space was filled with the deadly dance of starships, energy beams, and explosions. Maximus's tactical brilliance shone through as he directed his forces with precision and determination. Target their command ship, Maximus ordered, his voice cutting through the noise of battle. We need to disrupt their coordination. The Osiris's weapon systems locked onto the enemy command ship, unleashing a barrage of missiles and laser fire. The Putanese vessel shuddered under the assault, its shields flickering before finally collapsing. The ship erupted in a massive explosion, sending shockwaves through the enemy formation. On the ground, Federation troops, led by General Aaron Valeria, fought valiantly to repel the invaders. The battle was fierce, with both sides suffering heavy casualties. Valeria, her silver hair matted with sweat and grime, directed her soldiers with unwavering resolve. Hold the line, she shouted, her voice hoarse but strong. We must protect the civilians. The Federation forces, inspired by her leadership, pushed back against the Putanese attackers. The tide began to turn as the combined efforts of the fleet and ground troops drove the enemy into retreat. As the last of the Putonese ships fled into hyperspace, a cheer went up from the Federation defenders. The colony was saved, but the cost had been high. The once beautiful landscape of Terra Nova was scarred by craters and wreckage, a stark reminder of the brutality of war. The Counteroffensive With the immediate threat to Terra Nova neutralized, Maximus and his allies turned their attention to a counteroffensive. They knew that the Putinese would not stop their raids, and the only way to ensure the safety of the Federation was to strike back with equal ferocity. Intelligence reports indicated that the Putinese were using a forward base in the Carthan system as a staging ground for their raids. The base, heavily fortified and strategically located, was a key target. Maximus devised a plan to launch a coordinated strike to cripple their operations. In the war room aboard the Osiris, Maximus outlined the plan to his top officers. The holographic display showed the layout of the Putinese base and the surrounding area. We will hit them hard and fast, Maximus said, his eyes gleaming with determination. Ilara, your pirates will provide a distraction, drawing their forces away from the main base. Takara, your warriors will lead the ground assault. Rylor, your infiltrators will disable their defenses. General Valeria and I will command the main strike force from orbit. Alara Trent, her confidence unshaken, grinned. We'll make sure they never see it coming. Commander Takara, her reptilian eyes gleaming with anticipation, nodded. The Voth are ready. We will crush them. Ambassador Rylor, his calm demeanor masking his inner resolve, added, My team will ensure their defenses are down before the main assault. General Valeria, her expression serious, spoke last. We have the element of surprise. Let's use it to our advantage, the raid on Carthan. The operation began with Alara's pirates launching a series of hit-and-run attacks on the outskirts of the Carthan system. Their nimble ships darted in and out, sowing confusion and drawing the Putinese forces away from the main base. Meanwhile, Rylor's team of infiltrators slipped through the shadows, bypassing security checkpoints and disabling key systems. The base's defenses flickered and failed, leaving it vulnerable to the impending assault. 
As the Putinese scrambled to respond to the diversion, the main strike force moved into position. The Osiris led the charge, its weapons blazing as it engaged the enemy fleet. The battle was intense, with explosions lighting up the void and debris scattering in all directions. On the ground, Takara's warriors stormed the base with ruthless efficiency. Energy weapons crackled, and the air was filled with the sounds of combat as they clashed with the Putinese defenders. Takara fought at the forefront, her strength and ferocity driving her troops forward. Maximus, commanding from orbit, directed the assault with precision. Focus fire on their command center. We need to take out their leadership. The combined efforts of the alliance forces overwhelmed the Putinese. The command center fell, and the base was soon in ruins. The surviving enemy forces, demoralized and disorganized, retreated in disarray. The victory at Carthen was a significant blow to the Putinese ability to launch raids. It disrupted their operations and gave the Federation a much-needed respite. However, Maximus knew that the war was far from over. Skirmishes on the Frontier The campaign continued with a series of relentless skirmishes across the frontier. The Putonis, though weakened, continued to launch raids, and the Federation forces responded with equal determination. In the Tarvo sector, a vital trade route, Maximus and his fleet engaged a Putonese raiding party. The battle was fierce, with both sides taking heavy losses. The Osiris maneuvered through the chaos, its weapons systems delivering precise strikes that crippled the enemy ships. Lieutenant Commander Kale, her voice steady despite the intensity of the battle, relayed orders. Target their engines. We need to disable their mobility. The Federation forces executed the plan flawlessly. The Putinese ships, unable to maneuver, were picked off one by one. The trade route was secured, ensuring the flow of supplies to the front lines. In the Gorgon system, a Federation outpost came under attack. General Valeria, leading the defense, directed her troops with unwavering resolve. The outpost's defenders, though outnumbered, fought with tenacity and courage. Hold the line, Valeria shouted, her voice cutting through the din of battle. We cannot let them breach our defenses. The defenders held their ground, repelling wave after wave of Putinese assaults. The enemy, unable to break through, eventually retreated leaving the outpost battered but standing. Pushing the Limits The relentless skirmishes pushed Maximus and his comrades to their limits. The psychological toll of the constant fighting, the loss of friends and allies, and the ever-present threat of betrayal weighed heavily on them. Maximus found himself in the medbay one evening, visiting wounded soldiers. The sight of the injured, their bodies and spirits scarred by the war, filled him with a deep sense of responsibility. One soldier, a young woman named Jenna, looked up at him with weary eyes. Will it ever end, sir? Maximus knelt beside her, his expression resolute. It will. We fight so that one day no one else will have to suffer like this. We will see it through to the end. The words, though simple, carried a profound weight. They encapsulated the determination and resilience that defined the Federation's struggle. A glimmer of hope. Despite the hardships, there were moments of hope and unity that sustained the Alliance. The bond between the diverse members of the Coalition grew stronger with each battle, their shared experiences forging a sense of camaraderie and mutual respect. In a rare moment of respite, Maximus and his inner circle gathered in the mess hall of the Osiris. The atmosphere was one of weary but determined resolve, a reflection of their shared commitment to the cause. We've come a long way, Maximus said, raising a glass and a toast. We've faced unimaginable challenges and made incredible sacrifices, but our fight is far from over. We will continue to resist, to strike, and to fight for our freedom and the future of our people. Lieutenant Commander Kale, ever the stalwart supporter, added, Together, we are stronger than they could ever imagine and we will not rest until we see the end of Emperor Tabone's tyranny. The room erupted in cheers and applause, a testament to the unbreakable spirit of the rebellion. They knew that the road ahead would be fraught with danger and hardship, but they were prepared to face it with unwavering resolve. As Maximus looked around the room, he felt a renewed sense of hope. They were not just fighting for revenge, they were fighting for a better future. And with each victory, they moved one step closer to achieving that goal. 
This chapter showcases the intense and relentless nature of the conflict, the resilience and tactical prowess of Maximus and his forces, and the psychological toll on the characters. The vivid descriptions of skirmishes and the emotional depth of the narrative draw readers deeper into the epic struggle, setting the stage for the climactic confrontations to come. Chapter 9 Turning the Tide A Strategic Plan The relentless skirmishes and fierce battles had strained both sides, but Maximus and his allies knew they had to seize a decisive victory to turn the tide of the war. Intelligence reports indicated that three strategically significant planets in the Putinese sector were ripe for capture. These planets, long oppressed under Tabone's rule, housed critical military installations and resources that could significantly bolster the rebellion. Maximus gathered his top commanders in the war room of the Osiris. The holographic display projected detailed maps of the target planets, Ferax, Lyra, and Draconis. Each one presented unique challenges and opportunities. We need to strike swiftly and decisively, Maximus began, his gaze sweeping over the assembled leaders. Our objective is to liberate these planets and rally the local populations to our cause. Their support will be crucial in sustaining our momentum. General Aaron Valeria, always a voice of reason and strategy, nodded in agreement. We'll need to coordinate simultaneous assaults to prevent the Putinese from reinforcing their positions. Timing will be critical. Ambassador Ryler, ever the diplomat, added, We should also prepare to engage with the local leaders. Their willingness to support us will depend on how we present ourselves and our intentions. Commander Takara, her eyes gleaming with determination, hissed, Our warriors are ready. We will show them the strength of our resolve. Captain Alara Trent, leaning back with her characteristic confidence, grinned, And my crew will make sure we hit them where it hurts. With the plan set, the Alliance prepared for the most ambitious operation of the war thus far. The success of these missions would hinge not only on their military prowess, but also on their ability to inspire and unite the oppressed populations. The Battle for Ferax The first target was Ferax, a planet known for its rich mineral resources and heavily fortified military base. The Osiris led the assault, supported by a fleet of allied ships. The battle in orbit was fierce, with both sides unleashing devastating firepower. Maximus directed the assault with his usual precision. Focus on their defense grid. We need to create an opening for our ground forces. The Federation fleet executed a series of coordinated strikes, disabling key defense installations and allowing the ground troops to deploy. General Valeria led the charge her troops landing in strategic locations and engaging the Putinese defenders in intense urban combat. Valeria's voice crackled over the comms. We're encountering heavy resistance, but we're pushing forward. The locals are starting to come out of hiding. They're watching us. As the battle raged, the people of Ferax, long oppressed and fearful, began to see a glimmer of hope. Small groups of civilians started to assist the Federation troops, providing information and even joining the fight. A breakthrough came when Valeria's forces captured the central command center. The Putinese defenders, seeing the tide turn, began to surrender. The local population, emboldened by the victory, erupted in celebration. They welcomed the rebels as liberators, and many volunteered to join the fight against Tabone. The liberation of Lyra next was Lyra, a planet with a significant agricultural base and a critical supply depot for the Putinese military. The assault began with a series of surgical strikes by Rylor's infiltrators, who sabotaged the enemy's logistics and communication systems. As confusion spread among the Putinese forces, the main strike force, led by Takara's warriors, launched a ground assault. The Voth warriors moved with relentless precision, overwhelming the defenders and securing key locations. Maximus monitored the operation from the Osiris, issuing orders to adapt to the unfolding situation. Reinforce the southern flank. We need to secure the supply depot intact. The Federation troops moved swiftly, and within hours, they had taken control of the depot. The local population, witnessing the collapse of Putinese control, began to rise in support of the rebels. Farmers and laborers, armed with whatever they could find, joined the fight, driving out the remaining Putonese forces. The victory at Lyra was swift and decisive. 
The captured supplies bolstered the Federation's resources, and the enthusiastic support of the locals added fresh recruits to their ranks. The Siege of Draconis The final target was Draconis, a heavily industrialized planet with a significant Putinese garrison. The battle for Draconis was expected to be the toughest, and Maximus knew that success here would deal a severe blow to Tabone's war machine. The assault began with a massive bombardment from the Osiris and its fleet, targeting the heavily fortified defensive positions. As the bombardment softened the enemy defenses, Ilara's pirates launched daring raids to disrupt their command and control. Ilara, how are we looking? Maximus asked over the comms. We've taken out several key installations, Ilara replied, her voice full of excitement. Their defenses are crumbling. With the defenses weakened, the ground forces led by Maximus himself landed on Draconis. The fighting was brutal, with street-to-street -street combat and heavy casualties on both sides. Maximus fought at the front, his presence inspiring his troops and striking fear into the hearts of the enemy. As the battle reached its climax, the local population, driven by years of oppression and inspired by the rebels, rose in revolt. They provided critical support, guiding the rebels through the industrial maze and sabotaging Putinese positions. The turning point came when Maximus and his team breached the main factory complex, capturing the enemy commander. The Putinese garrison, demoralized and outnumbered, surrendered. The people of Draconis, seeing their oppressors defeated, joined the celebration and pledged their support to the rebellion. Growing Unity and Resolve the capture of Ferax, Lyra, and Draconis was a significant victory for the rebellion. The local populations, tired of Tabone's tyranny, rose in support of Maximus and his allies, further bolstering their ranks. The success of these operations demonstrated the growing unity and determination among the rebels. In a grand assembly on Ferax, Maximus addressed the gathered crowds. His voice carried over the sea of faces filled with hope and determination. We have struck a blow against tyranny. Maximus declared, but our fight is far from over. Together we will continue to resist, to strike, and to fight for a future free from oppression. We will bring an end to Tabone's reign, and we will build a new era of peace and justice. The crowd erupted in cheers, their spirits lifted by the victories and the promise of a brighter future. The alliance was stronger than ever, united by a common cause and a shared vision. General Valeria, standing beside Maximus, spoke with pride. Our success here is a testament to our strength and resolve. We are more than just soldiers. We are a force for liberation and justice. Ambassador Rylor, ever the diplomat, added, We must continue to build on this momentum. The support of the local populations is crucial to our success. We fight not just for ourselves, but for all who yearn for freedom. Commander Takara, her eyes gleaming with determination, hissed, We will not rest until Tabone is defeated. Our warriors are ready for whatever comes next. Captain Alara Trent, her confidence undiminished, grinned. And my crew will make sure we keep hitting them where it hurts. Preparing for the final push With the three planets secured and the ranks of the rebellion bolstered, Maximus and his allies began preparing for the final push against the Putinese Empire. The victories had turned the tide of the war, but they knew that the most challenging battles were yet to come. In the war room of the Osiris, Maximus and his top commanders plotted their next moves. The holographic display showed the strategic targets that would bring them closer to Emperor Tabone's stronghold. We've gained significant ground, but Tabone will not go down easily, Maximus said, his voice filled with resolve. We need to keep the pressure on and exploit every weakness. General Valeria nodded. Our next targets should be key supply lines and communication hubs. We need to isolate their forces and disrupt their command structure. Ambassador Rylor added, We should also continue to engage with the local populations. Their support will be vital in maintaining our momentum. Commander Takara, her gaze unwavering, hissed, Our warriors are ready. We will strike with precision and ferocity. Captain Alara Trent, leaning back with her characteristic confidence, grinned. And my crew will be right there, making sure we keep them on the run. With their strategy set and their spirits high, the Alliance prepared for the next phase of their epic struggle. The victories had shown that unity and determination could overcome even the most formidable enemies. Together, they would continue to fight, to resist, and to strive for the future they believed in.
Chapter 10. All-Out War. Declaration of War. The victories on Ferax, Lyra, and Draconis had shaken the Putonese Empire to its core. In a desperate bid to regain control and crush the rebellion, Emperor Tabone officially declared war on the Earth Federation. The galaxy held its breath as two mighty forces prepared for an all-out confrontation. President Lucius Kane addressed the Earth Federation from the capital. His voice carried the weight of the impending conflict, but also a steadfast resolve. The Putinese have declared war on us, but we will not back down, Kane proclaimed. We will meet their aggression with the full might of our fleets. We fight for our freedom, for our future, and for justice. Together, we will prevail. Across the galaxy, the Earth Federation's fleets mobilized, readying themselves for the battles to come. Warships gleamed under the light of distant stars, their crews steeling themselves for the epic conflict ahead. The Battle for Proxima Prime The first major engagement took place in the Proxima Prime system, a strategically vital sector with critical shipyards and supply depots. Both sides knew that control of Proxima Prime would be pivotal in the larger war. The Osiris arrived at the edge of the system, flanked by a formidable fleet of Federation warships. Maximus Primus stood on the bridge, his eyes fixed on the holographic display showing the approaching Putinese fleet. All ships prepare for battle, Maximus ordered, his voice calm but filled with resolve. The Putinese fleet, led by Admiral Zareth, a ruthless and experienced commander, moved into formation. The enemy ships were sleek and menacing, their weapons arrays glowing ominously. The battle began with a thunderous exchange of fire. Laser beams, missiles, and plasma bolts streaked across the void, creating a deadly tapestry of destruction. The Osiris led the charge, its advanced weaponry cutting through the enemy lines with precision. Focus fire on their cruisers, Maximus commanded. We need to break their formation. Federation ships maneuvered with agility, targeting the Putinese cruisers and exploiting weaknesses in their defenses. The void was filled with explosions as enemy ships were torn apart by the relentless assault. Admiral Zareth, realizing the danger, ordered his fleet to counterattack. Putoni's ships launched a coordinated strike, their weapons unleashing a devastating barrage. Incoming fire! Brace for impact! Lieutenant Commander Sarah Kale shouted. The Osiris's shields flared as they absorbed the hits. The ship shuddered, but its defenses held. Maximus's tactical brilliance shone through as he directed the fleet to adapt and counter the enemy's moves. Execute flanking maneuver Delta, Maximus ordered. Catch them in a crossfire. The Federation ships moved with precision, surrounding the Putinese fleet and unleashing a withering crossfire. The enemy's formation crumbled, and their ships began to fall back in disarray. Ground Assault on Proxima Prime While the space battle raged, ground forces prepared to engage the Putinese on the surface of Proxima Prime. General Aaron Valeria led the Federation troops, her strategic mind and unwavering resolve guiding the operation. The landing craft descended through the atmosphere, braving enemy anti-aircraft fire. Federation soldiers disembarked, their armor glinting in the sunlight as they moved to secure key positions. Push forward, secure the shipyards, Valeria commanded, her voice steady amidst the chaos. The ground battle was fierce, with Federation troops clashing with entrenched Putinese defenders. Energy weapons crackled, and explosions rocked the landscape. Valeria's tactical acumen and the bravery of her soldiers gradually turned the tide. In one intense skirmish, Valeria and her team breached the main shipyard complex. The fighting was brutal, with hand-to-hand -hand combat and desperate firefights. The Putinese defenders, realizing their position was untenable, began to surrender. With the shipyards secured, the Federation established a stronghold on Proxima Prime. The victory was a significant boost to morale and a critical step in the larger campaign. The Siege of Nova Terra The next major engagement took place on Nova Terra, a heavily fortified Putinese stronghold. The planet's defenses were formidable, with orbital platforms, planetary shields, and a massive ground garrison. Maximus and his fleet arrived at Nova Terra, ready to engage in one of the most challenging battles of the war. The Osiris moved into position, its sensors scanning the enemy defenses. All ships, target the orbital platforms, Maximus ordered. We need to neutralize their defenses before we can deploy ground forces. 
The Federation fleet unleashed a relentless barrage, targeting the orbital platforms and the planetary shields. The void was filled with the roar of weapons fire and the flash of explosions as the platforms were systematically destroyed. The Putinese, determined to defend their stronghold, launched a counteroffensive. Their ships, supported by ground-based artillery, struck back with ferocity. Enemy reinforcements incoming, Lieutenant Commander Kale reported. Maximus's mind raced as he adapted the battle plan. Redirect fire to the incoming ships. We need to hold them off until we can bring down the shields. The battle reached a fever pitch as both sides fought with everything they had. The Osiris's weapons blazed, cutting through enemy ships and clearing the way for the ground assault. On the surface, General Valeria and her troops prepared to land. The Federation forces, supported by Takara's warriors and Rylor's infiltrators, moved to secure the planet. Deploy all ground units, begin the assault, Valeria commanded. The landing craft descended, braving heavy anti-aircraft fire. Federation soldiers hit the ground running, engaging the Putonese defenders in intense urban combat. The fighting was fierce, with both sides taking heavy casualties. Valeria's voice crackled over the comms. We need to take down the shield generator. Focus all efforts on that target. The Federation forces pushed forward, battling their way through the city towards the shield generator. The fighting was brutal, with street-to-street -street combat and desperate last stands by the Putinese defenders. As the Federation troops reached the shield generator, a massive firefight erupted. Valeria, leading from the front, directed the assault with precision. The generator's defenses were formidable, but the Federation forces pressed on, determined to succeed. Charge! Valeria shouted, leading the final push. The shield generator exploded in a spectacular burst of energy, and the planetary shields collapsed. The Federation fleet, now unimpeded, moved into low orbit and provided critical support to the ground forces. With the shields down and the enemy in disarray, the Federation troops secured Nova Terra. The victory was a significant blow to the Putinese and a testament to the courage and determination of the Federation forces. The Battle of Elysium Prime The climax of the all-out war came with the battle for Elysium Prime, a planet of immense strategic importance. The Putinese had fortified Elysium Prime, making it a critical hub for their war efforts. Maximus and his fleet arrived at Elysium Prime, ready for the decisive engagement. The Osiris led the charge, its weapons blazing as it engaged the formidable Putinese defenses. All ships, focus fire on their command center, Maximus ordered. We need to decapitate their leadership. The Federation fleet unleashed a withering barrage, targeting the enemy command center and key defensive positions. The void was filled with the roar of battle, as both sides fought with everything they had. Admiral Zareth, leading the Putinese fleet, was a formidable opponent. His ships maneuvered with deadly precision, striking back at the Federation forces with ferocity. We're taking heavy fire, Kale reported, her voice tense. Maximus's mind raced as he adapted the battle plan. Execute flanking maneuver Alpha. We need to outmaneuver them. The Federation ships moved with precision, outflanking the Putinese fleet and delivering devastating strikes. The enemy ships began to falter, their formations breaking under the relentless assault. On the ground, General Valeria and her troops launched a daring assault on the enemy command center. The fighting was fierce, with both sides taking heavy casualties. Valeria's tactical brilliance and the bravery of her soldiers gradually turned the tide. Push forward! Take the command center! Valeria commanded. The Federation troops, inspired by her leadership, stormed the command center. The Putinese defenders, realizing their position was untenable, began to surrender. With the command center secured, the Federation forces established control over Elysium Prime. The victory was a decisive blow to the Putinese and a turning point in the war. The Aftermath The victories at Proxima Prime, Nova Terra, and Elysium Prime marked a significant turning point in the war. The Putinese, their forces decimated and their morale shattered, began to retreat across multiple fronts. Maximus and his allies, buoyed by their successes, prepared for the final push against Emperor Tabone. The alliance was stronger than ever, united by a common cause and a shared vision of a brighter future. In a grand assembly on Elysium Prime, Maximus addressed the gathered troops and civilians, his voice carried over the sea of faces, filled with hope and determination. We have struck a decisive blow against tyranny. 
Maximus declared, but our fight is not yet over. Together, we will continue to resist, to strike, and to fight for our freedom. We will bring an end to Tabone's reign, and we will build a new era of peace and justice. The crowd erupted in cheers, their spirits lifted by the victories and the promise of a brighter future. The alliance was stronger than ever, united by a common cause and a shared vision. General Valeria, standing beside Maximus, spoke with pride. Our success here is a testament to our strength and resolve. We are more than just soldiers. We are a force for liberation and justice. Ambassador Rylor, ever the diplomat, added, We must continue to build on this momentum. The support of the local populations is crucial to our success. We fight not just for ourselves, but for all who yearn for freedom. Commander Takara, her eyes gleaming with determination, hissed, We will not rest until Tabone is defeated. Our warriors are ready for whatever comes next. Captain Alara Trent, her confidence undiminished, grinned. And my crew will make sure we keep hitting them where it hurts. With their strategy set and their spirits high, the Alliance prepared for the next phase of their epic struggle. The victories had shown that unity and determination could overcome even the most formidable enemies. Together, they would continue to fight, to resist, and to strive for the future they believed in. This chapter is a symphony of destruction and heroism, showcasing the massive battles across multiple fronts, the detailed descriptions of the ships, weapons, and strategies used, and the growing unity and determination among the rebels. The vivid descriptions and emotional depth draw readers deeper into the epic struggle, setting the stage for the climactic confrontations to come. Chapter 11. Invasion, the Final Plan The victories in previous battles had set the stage for the ultimate confrontation. A full-scale invasion of the Putanese home world, Tabona. Emperor Tabone's stronghold was the heart of his empire, a heavily fortified planet bristling with defenses. The Earth Federation and its allies knew that capturing Tabona would be the decisive blow needed to end the war. In the war room of the Osiris, Maximus Primus and his top commanders gathered to finalize their invasion plans. Holographic displays showed detailed maps of Tabona, highlighting key military installations and defensive positions. Our objective is clear. Maximus began, his voice resolute. We will launch a full-scale invasion of Tabona. This will be the most challenging operation we have ever undertaken, but it is necessary to bring an end to Tabone's tyranny. General Aaron Valeria, ever the strategist, nodded. We will need to coordinate our forces carefully. The enemy's defenses are formidable, and we must be prepared for heavy resistance. Ambassador Rylor, representing the Aryan Confederacy, added, we have secured support from the local populations on the recently liberated planets. They will provide us with critical intelligence and logistical support. Commander Takara, her eyes gleaming with determination, hissed, Our warriors are ready. We will strike with all our strength. Captain Alara Trent, her confidence unwavering, grinned. And my crew will be right there, making sure we keep the pressure on. With the plan set, the Alliance prepared for the most significant and dangerous operation of the war. The invasion of Tabona would require immense coordination, bravery, and sacrifice. The Invasion Begins The invasion fleet, a vast armada of warships, transport vessels, and support craft assembled in orbit around Elysium Prime. The sight was awe-inspiring, a testament to the unity and determination of the Allied forces. Maximus stood on the bridge of the Osiris, his gaze fixed on the planet below. All ships, prepare for jump, he ordered. This is it. We bring the fight to Tabona. The fleet jumped to hyperspace, hurtling towards Tabona with unwavering resolve. As they emerged from hyperspace, the sight of the heavily fortified planet filled the view screens. Enemy defenses are active, Lieutenant Commander Sarah Kale reported. They're launching fighters and preparing their ground defenses. Begin the assault, Maximus commanded. All ships, engage the enemy. The void of space erupted in a symphony of destruction as the Allied fleet engaged the Putanese defenses. Warships exchanged volleys of laser fire, missiles streaked across the void, and explosions lit up the darkness. The Osiris led the charge, its advanced weaponry cutting through the enemy lines with precision. 
Target their orbital platforms, Maximus ordered. We need to clear the way for our ground forces. Federation ships unleashed a relentless barrage, targeting the orbital platforms and the planetary defense grid. The enemy's defenses, though formidable, began to falter under the sustained assault. The ground assault. With the orbital defenses neutralized, the ground assault began. Transport vessels descended through the atmosphere, braving anti-aircraft fire as they delivered troops, armor, and supplies to the surface. General Valeria led the ground forces, her strategic mind and unwavering resolve guiding the operation. The landscape of Tabona was a grim sight, with fortified bunkers, trenches, and artillery emplacements dotting the terrain. Deploy all units, Valeria commanded. We need to secure the landing zones and push forward. The ground forces, composed of Federation soldiers, Voth warriors, and Aryan infiltrators, hit the ground running. The fighting was intense, with energy weapons crackling and explosions rocking the landscape. The air was filled with the sounds of battle, a cacophony of destruction and heroism. Valeria directed her troops with precision, coordinating attacks and reinforcing key positions. Focus on the artillery emplacements. We need to neutralize their firepower. Federation tanks and armored vehicles rumbled across the battlefield, their cannons roaring as they engaged the enemy fortifications. Infantry units advanced behind the armored columns, providing covering fire and engaging in brutal close-quarters combat. The Battle for the Capital The most significant objective of the invasion was the capital city of Tabon, a sprawling metropolis and the seat of Emperor Tabon's power. The city was heavily fortified, with towering defenses and legions of soldiers ready to defend it. Maximus led the assault on the capital, his presence inspiring the troops and striking fear into the hearts of the enemy. The Osiris provided critical air support, its weapon systems targeting enemy strongpoints and clearing the way for the ground forces. Push forward! We need to breach their defenses and capture the city, Maximus commanded, his voice carrying over the din of battle. The fighting in the capital was fierce and chaotic. Federation soldiers clashed with Putinese defenders in the streets, the air filled with the roar of battle and the cries of the wounded. Buildings crumbled under the relentless assault, and the city became a war zone. Maximus fought at the forefront, his skills and determination unmatched. He led his troops through the narrow streets and alleys, engaging the enemy in brutal combat. The Federation forces, inspired by his leadership, pressed forward with unwavering resolve. In one particularly intense skirmish, Maximus and his team breached a heavily defended compound. The fighting was fierce, with both sides taking heavy casualties. As they reached the central courtyard, Maximus spotted a high-ranking Putinese officer. Take him down, Maximus ordered. The team moved with precision, cutting through the enemy guards and capturing the officer. The information he provided was invaluable, revealing key defensive positions and weaknesses in the enemy's fortifications. Sacrifices and Heroism The invasion of Tabona was a brutal and costly endeavor. The Allied forces faced immense challenges and personal sacrifices, each battle pushing them to their limits. Lieutenant Commander Sarah Kale, a stalwart supporter of Maximus, found herself in the thick of the fighting. Leading a squad of soldiers, she engaged the enemy with determination and bravery. In one intense firefight, her squad was pinned down by heavy enemy fire. Hold your ground, Kale shouted, her voice steady despite the chaos. We can't let them push us back. With quick thinking and precise orders, Kale directed her squad to flank the enemy position. The maneuver was risky, but it succeeded in breaking the enemy's line. As the dust settled, Kale's squad regrouped, their spirits lifted by the hard-won victory. General Valeria, ever the strategic mind, faced her own challenges. Coordinating the massive invasion force required immense skill and resilience. In the heat of battle, she made critical decisions that saved countless lives and ensured the success of the operation. During a particularly fierce engagement, Valeria found herself leading a charge to retake a critical supply depot. The fighting was intense, with heavy casualties on both sides. Valeria's tactical acumen and unwavering resolve turned the tide, securing the depot and providing much-needed supplies to the front lines. The Fall of the Citadel The climax of the invasion came with the assault on the Imperial Citadel, the heart of Emperor Tabone's power. Chapter 12 The Fall of the Emperor
The Temple Towers The fall of the imperial citadel and the death of Emperor Tabone marked the beginning of the end for the Putoni's empire. However, Maximus knew that the ultimate symbol of victory would be raising the Earth Federation flag over the Temple Towers, the ancient seat of Putoni's power. But more to Maximus, this is where his son's ashes lay in wait. Maximus and his elite team moved swiftly through the war-torn city of Tabone, their objective clear. The temple towers loomed in the distance, their spires piercing the sky. The path to the towers was heavily guarded, and the final confrontation would be the most challenging yet. General Valeria coordinated the broader assault, ensuring that Federation forces secured key positions and maintained pressure on the remaining Putoni's defenders. Lieutenant Commander Sarah Kale led the tactical teams, providing support and covering fire as Maximus advanced. The Final Push Maximus and his team approached the base of the Temple Towers, the air thick with tension. The remaining Putoni's forces had regrouped here, determined to make a last stand. The ancient architecture of the towers, a blend of imposing stone and alien technology, reflected the might and history of the Putanese Empire. Stay focused, Maximus instructed his team. This is our final push. We need to take the towers and raise our flag. As they advanced, the team encountered fierce resistance. Putanese soldiers, loyal to the end, fought with desperation. The corridors of the towers echoed with the sounds of battle, energy weapons firing, explosions, and the cries of the wounded. Maximus fought at the forefront, his presence inspiring his team and striking fear into the hearts of the enemy. Each step forward was harder, and each room cleared, bringing them closer to their goal. In a particularly intense skirmish, Maximus and his team breached a heavily fortified chamber. The fighting was brutal, with hand-to-hand -hand combat and close-quarters firefights. The Putanese defenders, realizing the futility of their resistance, began to fall back. We're almost there, Kale reported, her voice filled with determination. The central chamber is just ahead. The climactic showdown. The team reached the entrance to the central chamber, the heart of the temple towers. The massive doors were guarded by Tabone's elite soldiers, their resolve unbroken despite the overwhelming odds. Prepare to breach, Maximus ordered, his voice steady. The team moved into position, planting charges on the door. The explosion rocked the towers, and the doors were blown open. Maximus and his team stormed the chamber, their weapons at the ready. Inside, Emperor Tabone stood atop a grand dais, his eyes blazing with fury and defiance. The room was vast and ornate, a testament to the power and grandeur of the Putoni's empire. The walls were adorned with ancient symbols and tapestries, and the air was thick with the scent of incense. Tabone's voice echoed through the chamber, filled with contempt. You think you can defeat me, Primus? You are nothing but a pawn in a larger game. Maximus stepped forward, his eyes locked on Tabone. Maximus did not speak a word, but remained silent, thinking in his mind, for Patrick, for all the lives Tabone destroyed. Tabone sneered, his claws flexing. You are driven by vengeance, but you will find only death. The battle that ensued was a whirlwind of emotions and ferocity. Maximus and Tabone clashed in a duel that shook the foundations of the Temple Towers. The Emperor's speed and strength were formidable, but Maximus fought with the determination and fury of a man avenging his fallen son. The room echoed with the sounds of their struggle, blades clashing, energy discharges, and the grunts of exertion. Maximus fought with precision and skill, every move calculated, every strike purposeful. Trachybiumph and Sacrifice The duel reached its climax as Maximus and Tabone clashed in a final decisive exchange. With a powerful strike, Maximus disarmed Tabone, sending the Emperor's weapon clattering across the floor. 
breathing heavily, Maximus stood over the fallen emperor. Tabon, his eyes filled with rage and fear, spat defiantly. You may kill me, but my legacy will endure. Maximus's voice was cold and resolute. Your legacy ends here. With a swift decisive motion, Maximus ended Tabone's life with a swift blade that beheaded the emperor in the same spot where Patrick was murdered. The emperor's body crumpled to the floor, the symbol of tyranny and oppression finally vanquished. The chamber fell silent, the weight of the moment pressing down on everyone present. Maximus stood over Tabone's lifeless body, his emotions a whirlwind of triumph, sorrow, and relief. Maximus's team joined him, surrounding Emperor Tabon Syept of the last emperor of the Putonis Empire. The long journey of vengeance and justice had finally reached its end, raising the flag. With the battle won, Maximus and his team moved to the Temple Tower's highest spire. The wind whipped around them as they reached the summit, and the view of the liberated city stretched out below. General Valeria and Lieutenant Commander Kyle joined Maximus, their expressions filled with pride and determination. The Earth Federation flag, a symbol of freedom and justice, was unfurled and raised high above the towers. As the flag rose, cheers erupted from the city below. The sight of the Federation flag flying over the Temple Towers was a powerful symbol, the ultimate triumph over tyranny and the dawn of a new era. Maximus stood at the edge of the spire, looking out over the city. His thoughts turned to Patrick, to the countless lives lost, and to the future they had fought so hard to secure. Maximus Primus, as he stood on the towers, he kneeled and removed Patrick's ashes to return them next to his mother. A sense of peace washed over him, knowing that their sacrifices had not been in vain. A New Beginning With Emperor Tabon defeated and the Putoni's empire crumbling, the galaxy began to heal. The Earth Federation and its allies worked tirelessly to rebuild, to bring justice to those who had suffered, and to ensure a future free from oppression. Maximus, though forever marked by the journey he had taken, found solace in the new beginning they had forged. He continued to serve the Federation, helping to guide the rebuilding efforts and to ensure that the hard-won peace endured. In a ceremony held in the newly liberated capital, President Lucius Kane addressed the galaxy. Today we stand united in the face of adversity. We have shown that tyranny and oppression can be defeated and that freedom and justice will always prevail. This victory belongs to all of us, and together we will build a brighter future. Maximus stood among the gathered leaders, his heart filled with pride and hope. The journey had been long and arduous, but the triumph of the promise of justice and a new beginning made every sacrifice worthwhile, thought Maximus, as he walked down a long hallway from the stage. Just then, he saw a woman approaching. Admiral Primus, she said, as she continued to walk towards him. Hi, sir. I'm a reporter and editor with the Galaxy News Network. Maximus felt like he recognized her voice. She stepped into the light, two feet in front of him with a big smile, and extended her hand. Hi, sir, she said. I'm Pamela Givens. May I have an interview with you? Maximus was momentarily stunned. She looked exactly like his wife. After a moment, he smiled and said, Yes, you may. They both walked away down the hall together. The resemblance between Pamela and Maximus's wife was amazing to everyone. Let's just say the future sounds bright for more Primus in the future. Fade out. Please like and subscribe to our channel and don't forget to comment and share.